Hello everyone, and welcome to this lecture where we're going to be getting started with Django. We finally reached the moment we've been waiting for throughout the whole course, using our Python skills and all our front-end skills, along with the Django Web Framework. But before we actually dive into the technical details of Django, let's learn a little more about it and its really interesting background. Django is a free and open source web framework. And being a web framework, it really allows us to solve two major problems. It allows us to map a requested URL from a user to the code that's actually meant to handle it. And then it also allows us to create that requested HTML dynamically. So using templates, which we'll learn about later on, we can actually inject calculated values or information from the database into an HTML page to show to the user. So we're going to be really connecting all the front end stuff to the back end stuff through this web framework. And Django is extremely popular. It's used by many sites, including things such as Pinterest, PBS, Instagram, Bitbucket, Washington Times, Mozilla, and much more. You can check out the official Django website for a whole list of example websites that operate using Django's web framework. Django was created in 2003 when the web developers at the Lawrence Journal World Newspaper started using Python for their development. And the fact that it originated at a newspaper is actually really important to the culture that surrounds Django. Because the original developers were surrounded by those newspaper writers, good written documentation is a key part of Django. And we're going to be exploring the documentation as we go along through this part of the course. And that also means that you have excellent references to check out on the official Django documentation pages. Django has its own excellent basic tutorial where you're basically walk through creating a basic polling web application. And I would definitely suggest that you check out that polling tutorial later on throughout this course. And also the reason it's a poll is because that also extends back to its newspaper roots. If you're on a newspaper website, you may want to poll your readers to see whether or not they agree with the topic of a story. So when encountering Django tutorials, you're going to often read that you should use what's called a virtual environment, or you'll sometimes also see it as VENV. Let's talk about what a virtual environment is, how to use it, and why it's so important to use one whenever you're working with Django for a large project. A virtual environment allows you to have a virtual installation of Python and packages on your computer. So why would you ever actually want or need this? You've already installed Python, why bother with a virtual environment? Python packages change and get updated often. And there are changes that sometimes break backwards compatibility that your web application or web project may depend on. So what do you do if you want to test out the new features of a package update, but you also don't want to break your current web application? After all, you can't just take down your website every time a package gets updated. Well, that's where a virtual environment comes in. You can create a virtual environment that contains the newer version of the package or a virtual environment for your older version of the package. And luckily, Anaconda makes this really easy for us. A virtual environment handler is already included. So to use this virtual environment with Conda, you're going to use the following commands. And we'll walk through this in just a little bit. But the Conda create command initiates the virtual environment. So we say Conda create space, dash, dash, name, and then another space, and you type in the name of your environment. So in this case, I've called my environment my env there. And then the last word there, Django, is going to say, well, what package do I want to initiate this environment with? And Conda requires that. So you will say Conda create, dash, dash, name, the name of your virtual environment, and then the package that you want to start that environment with. And later on, you can specify a specific version for that package. So you can say Django, something like equals equals 1.9 or 1.8, 1.10, etc. And then you can activate that environment with activate space the name of the environment. And this all happens at the command line. Now, anything installed with pip or conda when this environment is activated will only really be installed for that environment. So that allows you to create separate versions of packages and pythons all on one computer with the use of these virtual environments. And then you can deactivate the environment with deactivate my env or the name of the environment. And it's highly encouraged to use virtual environments for your projects to keep them self-contained and not run into issues when packages are updated. All right, so let's jump to our command line and show you an example of actually creating a virtual environment. Okay, here I am at the Atom text editor. And before we get started, by walking through a virtual environment using Conda, 
What I wanted to point out is that Conda itself has really good documentation on creating virtual environments or managing environments, and it's linked to in the resource notes, but let me jump to that website real quick over here and show you what it looks like. Just go to conda.io slash doc slash using slash envs for environments.html or just Google search Conda environments should take you to this page or just use the resource link. But this has a lot more details than what we're gonna be showing here. Shows you how to create an environment, change an environment, clone an environment, remove, etc. So if you ever have any questions further than what we discuss here, you have uh, this documentation that will walk you through all of these steps. So what we're going to be doing is creating an environment. And there's an example here, conda create dash dash name. They're calling their environment snowflakes and it uses biopython. So let's actually create a virtual environment that will create a virtual environment for Django for us. So I will come back to Adam, click plus here to open up my terminal. And then what I will do is say this, conda create dash dash name and let's call this my Django ENV and then I will type Django because that's the package I want to initiate my Django ENV or environment with. I will hit enter and what it's going to do is download that Django package if I don't have it already and then apply it to that virtual environment. And Conda is actually pretty smart and it will know that if you have already a similar version of Django somewhere installed on your computer, it may not need to copy it, it will just reference it. That way you don't need to download anything, it will just reference previous installations. I don't have Django on this computer yet, so what it will do is fetch that metadata, and let me expand this to show you what happens, and it will ask you, hey, these new packages are going to be installed, is that okay with you? And I will say no right now, because I actually don't want Python 2.7, I want Python 3. So what I'm going to do is say no on proceed, and instead I will say this, conda create name, and let's say my Django env, and instead of starting it with Django, I'm going to start it with Python 3. And the reason I'm doing this is to show you an example of specifying a specific version of Python or a package. So it's a very similar process. You say conda create dash dash name, the name of your actual environment. And in this case, instead of a package, I will say Python. And then you say equals, and then you type in the version number you want. So for instance, I want Python 3.5. I'm going to hit enter. It will fetch that package metadata again. It will show me the new packages that will be installed. Here, I can see that I have the correct version of Python I want, 3.5. You can also do uh, 3.6, depending on when you're actually viewing this course, if that's been added to Conda. But let's stick with something 3.4 or above. So 3.4, 3.5, 3.6, those should all work fine for what we're going to be doing. I'm going to proceed on that, select Y, and then I will jump forward in time for this to all be downloaded and installed. I'll see you there. All right, so that has finished installing, and now we actually get the instruction. So to activate this environment, we can use activate, and then the name of the environment, and then to deactivate it, once we're done using it, we can say deactivate, and that will deactivate the environment. And if we ever wanna use it again, we can easily just activate it with the activate command. And if you're on a Mac or Linux computer and you're using bash, you'll probably have to use source, so keep that in mind. All right, now that we've set up our actual environment, it's time to activate it. A quick note, in case you forget what environments you have on your computer, you can easily list them through this command, conda info dash dash envs, and this will list out all the environments you have. Here I just have my default anaconda, the root environment, and then this environment I created, my Django env. And depending on what anaconda version you initially installed, this may say anaconda 3 instead of anaconda 2. But let's actually activate this environment. If you're on Linux or Mac OS and you're using Bash, you will probably have to say source, activate, and then the name of the environment, Django ENV. Since I'm on a Windows computer right now, I don't need to specify source. So let's bring that back down to just activate my Django ENV. I hit enter, 
and it will activate the environment. And the way I can tell that the environment is activated is you should see here in parentheses, my Django ENV. And that means that everything I do right now in regards to Python is going to only take effect on this environment, which means if I decide to install Django in this environment, it's only gonna be installed that specific version of Django for this virtual environment. In fact, let's do that now. I will say conda install Django, hit enter, and this will install the latest version of Django. And for this course, basically any version of Django that's higher than 1.8 should work just fine. So 1.8, 1.9, or at the time of this course, 1.10 should be fine. Let's say proceed Y, but I do encourage you to at least use 1.10. That way everything we do in this course matches up exactly with what's on your computer. Okay, I'm going to hop forward in time for this to finish installing and downloading. All right, so that finished installing Django to this virtual environment. And if I wanna confirm if this virtual environment is actually working correctly, I can just type in Python into this command line. And I notice that the version of Python here matches the version of the environment. If I were to say quit, and then deactivate this environment. So if I just say deactivate, notice I'm no longer in the virtual environment. So if I say Python now, I am back to my original installation of Python, which happened to be this 2.7 version. So that's a nice little confirmation that you're in the virtual environment and you're actually doing effects on that environment. Let's say quit and we're ready to go. Okay. So we did a lot of housekeeping stuff in this lecture, haven't actually dived into Django, but a lot of this stuff is really important and it's going to clear you of headaches later on if you don't learn how to actually use virtual environments correctly. So by this lecture, you should have a full understanding of virtual environments, at least how to create them, activate them, and deactivate them. You can always reference that link in the resources if you want more information about the environments and you should have installed Django to your virtual environment. Coming up next, we're actually going to get started with using Django. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing creating your first Django project. In future lectures, we'll actually discuss the difference between a Django project and a Django application. But by the end of this lecture, we should be able to actually run a Django project, a little server locally, and see it in our browser. In case you haven't done so already, you'll need to install Django. You can do that either with a conda install Django or for a normal Python distribution, pip install Django. And remember, if you're using a virtual environment, you should activate the virtual environment before running any of the command lines, commands that we actually do throughout this section of the course. So when you install Django, it's actually also going to install a command line tool called Django-admin. And this command line tool is just a useful feature for us to quickly run things straight from the command line. So what we can do is create our first project. And for that, just go to your command prompt, activate your virtual environment if you haven't done so already, and then say Django-admin space start project space, and then whatever you want your project to be called. In this case, we will say first underscore project. And then you're gonna get something that looks like this. And we'll explain what all these files are in just a second. But before we do, let's actually run this code. I'm going to jump to the Atom text editor, open up a command prompt and run through this. All right, here I am at the Atom text editor. What I will do is open up a new terminal or command prompt, and I'm going to change directory to my desktop and actually make a new folder. So I will say mkdir, that's make directory, same for Mac or Windows users. And I'm just going to make a new folder on my desktop to contain all the Django code that we're gonna be working with for this particular section of the course. If you already have a folder like that, you can just change directory into that folder. But what I will do is I will say my Django stuff. So I will make that directory and then I will cd into my Django stuff and there I have it. So I have that directory made and what I will do now is just add that to Atom. So I will say file, add a project folder, go to my desktop, my Django stuff is there, select that folder and I can see it here now. Great. So now let's actually create that first project using that Django-admin command line tool. 
Before I do that though, I'm going to want to activate the virtual environment I created in the previous lecture. If you're not using a virtual environment, that's okay. Just make sure you've installed Django. So I will say activate. Remember, if you're using Mac or Linux, you want to say source activate, and then the name of the Django environment. And that one was just called my Django ENV. Hit enter, and now that's activated. And then what I'm going to do is call the Django command line tool. I will say Django admin start project, and then whatever you want to call this very first project we're working on. In this case, I'll keep it simple and just say first underscore project. Hit enter, and this is actually going to create that first project. So what you will notice now is in this directory, I've created my first project here. And here I have the first project folder, and you should have a nested folder of the same name, and then a couple files, that init.py file, settings.py, urls.py, wsgi, and then manage.py. What we're going to do now is take a little bit of time to explain what each of these files does. And you'll notice that one of them is empty. That's okay. That's the way it should be. And what I want you to do is check out these various files as I go along back to the presentation and explain in very brief detail what all of these files actually are doing. Let's hop back to the presentation. Okay, so here are the command lines we just initiated. And after that, we should get something like this. So let's take a little bit of time to explain what's actually going on here. Let's go th first through that init.py file. So that underscore underscore init underscore underscore dot pi file, that's actually just a blank Python script. And due to its special name, it lets Python know that this directory can be treated as a package. Then we have the settings.py file, and this is where we're actually going to be storing all of our project settings. Then we have the urls.py file, and this is essentially a Python script that's going to store all the URL patterns for your project. And that's basically going to relate to the different pages of your web application and how they should connect to the end user. Now keep in mind, this particular file is really going to make a lot of use of regular expressions. So before tackling this urls.py file in future lectures, make sure you review the regular expressions lecture from the Python section of this course. Then we have that wsgi.py file, and that's a Python script that acts as the web server gateway interface. And essentially what it's going to help us with is later on, when we actually want to deploy our web app to production on some online server, that file is going to help us out there. Then we have the manage.py, and that's under that top directory. And this is a Python script that we're going to be using a lot it's going to be associated with many of the commands we use as we build our web project and web application. Okay, so now let's actually use manage.py. In your command line, what I want you to do is, after activating your virtual environment, of course, type python space manage.py space run server. So here what we can actually see what's happening is we're calling python to run that manage.py file, and off of that py file, we actually want to specifically call that run server command. And what you're going to see is a bunch of stuff, but at the bottom, you should see something that looks like this. Your particular version of Django, the settings you're using, and then it's starting a development server at a URL. And what you will do is copy and paste that URL into your browser, and you should now see your very first web page being locally hosted on your computer. And that's a big congratulatory step because you now just ran your very first Django project. Let me walk you through all of that back at the Atom Text Editor. All right, we're back at the Atom text editor, and before I run that python manage.py run server command, I wanna make sure I'm in the right directory so that I can actually find it when I call it. So notice here that if I collapse that folder, it's under my Django stuff, under first project, that very first folder. So what I will do here is cd to that first project folder, and here's where I'm going to call that actual command. I will say python, manage.py run server, and then hit enter and actually run this. Okay, so you'll notice I get some outputs here, and sometimes you'll actually get a warning in red coloring, but here, uh, due to this newer version of Django, it's not such a noticeable red warning, but it will tell you that you have some unapplied migrations, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. More importantly, we see here that it's starting the development server at this particular URL. So what I want you to do is copy this, just right click that and copy it, or just type it straight into your browser, 
and put it into your browser. All right, so I've jumped to my browser and I've typed in that URL and you'll get something that looks like this. It worked. Congratulations on your first Django powered page. So this is pretty awesome. We actually have something running locally on our computer and it says welcome to Django as the title. And of course, we haven't actually done any work yet, but the next step is to actually start our first application by running something that looks like this. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But a quick little message, it'll say something like, you're seeing this because you have debug is equal to true. So in our Django settings file, we actually have a debug option that we can set to true or false. And we'll talk about that later on in future lectures. And as we build our website, we'll always have it to true. But when we want to actually push something to production, we'll make sure to turn it up to false. So that way, if an error arises, the user doesn't have access to our debugging tools with Django. OK, now what I want to talk about is that migrations warning. So if I minimize this and come back to right here in Atom, we see we have 13 unapplied migrations. Let's take a little bit of time to discuss what migrations actually are and how they relate to the database when you're using Django. All right, so as we just noted, we have our very first Django powered application or project running locally in our computer. So a big congratulations to you, pat yourself on the back. But as I mentioned, we noticed that warning about migrations and this has to do with databases and how to connect them to Django. The question arises, what is a migration? Well, a migration allows you to move databases from one design to another. And this is also reversible and that's why it's called a migration. Let's say you have a database and you want to edit a new field or add something like a new column, you can go ahead and migrate those changes over. And you can actually reverse that as well. So you can migrate your database. We're going to touch back on this later, especially when we actually talk about connecting Django to a database. But for now, you can ignore this warning. I know it says in that command prompt to run some sort of migrations uh, command at the command line. Right now, we'll just uh, back off on this and keep it in the back of our minds. So that was it as far as the basics of getting started with Django. We started our first Django project, but up next we're going to continue by creating a very simple Hello World Django application. I hope you're excited because now we're actually going to get right into the nitty gritty of working with Django. Thanks everyone, and I will see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing how to create our first Django application with a very simple view. So far, we've been able to use Run Server to test our installation of Django. Now let's move on to actually creating our first Django application. We'll learn about views and how to use them. Let's get some terminology straight though before we continue. A Django project is a collection of applications and configurations that when combined together is going to make up the full web application or website. That's your complete website running with Django. A lot of times people use the term web application to describe a website. So try not to get it confused with a Django application. A Django application is created to perform a particular functionality for your entire web application. So for example, you could have a registration Django application or a polling Django application, a comments Django application. So a polling app, comments app, etc. These Django apps or Django applications can then be plugged into other Django projects so you can reuse them or more importantly, use other people's Django applications. This process of being able to take a Django application and plug it into another Django project leads to the terminology of pluggable Django applications. Okay, let's continue on by creating a simple application with the following command. We'll go back and use that manage.py file. We're going to be using it a lot throughout the course. And we'll say Python manage.py start app and then first underscore app. So within our Django project, we're creating a Django application. I'm going to jump to Atom to get started. All right, here I am back at the Atom text editor. And right now I'm located under the first project directory, that top level directory. And you'll notice we also get this db.sqlite3 when we ran our server from last time, we can just uh, let it be for now and ignore it. What we want to do is with our virtual environment activated, actually create that first simple Django application. So what I'm going to type is Python manage.py. And then the keyword here is start app. And then whatever you want to call this first application, since we're doing something really basic, like a hello world type app, I'm just going to say first underscore 
hit enter, and you'll notice that we now get this first app inside of our first project directory. So this is a Django application. You'll see that it looks kind of similar to what we had when we actually ran our first project, but we get some different files here. We get views, tests, models, apps, admin, and init. Let's discuss what all of these files stand for and how they all work. I'm going to jump back to the presentation now. Okay, so we created all those files with that start app command. Now let's discuss what all these files are for. Here we have another init.py file, and that's serving the exact same purpose as we discussed previously. It's just a blank Python script that, due to its special name, lets Python know that this directory can be treated as a package. Then we have the admin.py, and this is where you can register your models so that you can benefit from some Django machinery that basically creates an admin interface for you. And later on, we'll see how fantastic the built-in admin features of Django are. It's a really powerful tool, and it's all built into Django. Then we have the apps.py file, and that essentially provides a place for any application-specific configuration. Then we have the models.py, and this is going to be a place to store your application's data models. And that's where you're going to specify the entities and relationships between the data. And that will make a lot more sense when we actually begin to play with that file. Then we have the test.py file, and this is where you can store a series of functions to test out your application's code. Then we have views.py, which is where you can store a series of functions that handle requests and return responses. Then finally, we have that migrations directory or migrations folder. And this directory stores database-specific information as it relates to the models. So the views.py and the models.py are the two files you're going to be using for any given application. And the form part of that main architectural design pattern employed by Django is the model view template pattern. And you can check out the official Django documentation to see how models, views, and templates all relate to each other in a lot more detail. But before we get started with any of this, we actually need to tell Django that we just created this application. We need to let it know that first underscore app actually exists. So what we'll do is go back to the settings.py file of our project and add in that first app. Then once Django knows about the application's existence, we can learn the process of creating a view and mapping it to our URL to complete this entire process. Let's jump back to the Atom text editor and do all of these tasks. Okay, here I am back at Atom text editor. And what I wanna do is check out this settings.py that was created when we first created our project. And again, these are the Django settings for the first project project. If we scroll down, we'll see a bunch of variables. The one we're looking for is called installed apps. And here they are. We see installed apps, and it's essentially what a list is with uh, some string application definitions. And what we need to do is add in our own application, this first underscore app. You can see here that Django automatically adds its own default apps like authorization, administration apps, messages, etc., static files, all of which we're going to be discussing in future lectures. But right now, let's add in as a string that application we just created, which is first underscore app. And then what we will do is save this. I can just do control S to save that, and that's saved. And with Adam, what's nice is there'll be a little blue dot here to let you know that you haven't saved it yet. To make sure all of this actually worked, we're just going to run the server again one more time and make sure we have no errors. So I will say Python space manage.py and then select that run server command. Hit enter and as long as I don't get any errors then everything should be working fine. I can just copy and paste this into a browser. Whoops, looks like I did control C which makes sense. Let's run that again and I should right click this. so. Highlight that, copy it, and I'm going to input it into a browser and make sure it's working. And you can see here that I've input it into a browser on my other screen. I'm gonna drag it over real quick, and we see that everything is still working. Good. That means the first app is working fine on the installed apps, so I will do Control C to exit out of that. The next step that we want to do is actually create a view. So now that our first app application has been created, what we can do is create a simple view. And for our very first view, we're going to just send some back some simple text, like a hello world. We won't concern ourselves with actually using models or templates just yet. We're going to discuss that in a future lecture. So what we will do is open up 
the views.py right here. And this is under our, let me minimize this. This is under our application folder. So we have views.py and it says from Django.shortcuts import render. What we need to do is add in a little bit of code here. We also need to say from Django.http import HTTP response. And then I'm going to create a function called index and that's going to take in request. And then it's going to return HTTP response and I'm just going to pass in a string here that says hello world. Okay, so let's discuss line by line what's actually happening here. First, we had to import HTTP response object from the Django.HTTP module. And then each view for this application is going to exist within that views.py file as its own individual function. And in this instance, we just created one view called index with that index function. And each view is also going to take in at least one argument. And for that HTTP request object, since it lives inside that Django HTTP module, by convention, we usually call this the request. But again, you could actually just call this whatever you want. This could be jelly donut as a variable. It really wouldn't matter. But by convention, we call it request. And you'll notice that regardless of what is uh, passed into this function, it returns HTTP response and then this text, hello world. So each view must return an HTTP response object. And this very simple response object just is going to take in a string parameter representing the content of the page. So what I could also do is pass in some HTML in there, which we'll show later on. In order for us to actually see this view when we're running our server, what we have to do is map this view to the urls.py file. So I will open up here, first underscore project, and jump here to the urls.py and open that up. And you see here, it tells you some information and it actually tells you uh, what to do. So if you want to add an import, you say from my app import views, which is exactly what we're going to do, except in this case, it's not my app, it's first app. So I'm going to scroll down here and you'll notice a, what is essentially looking like a list of function calls to URL. And I'm going to add in one more over here. And I will say, call this URL function and this is where it's going to look a little weird because we're using some regular expressions. So you may want to review those as we go along. But we'll just say our single uh, apostrophe there or a single quote and then that little caret symbol or chevron it's also called and then another single quote. And sometimes Adam will automatically post a double quote there so just delete it. So that's the first argument. It's a regular expression and we'll explain what that actually means in a second. And then we need to pass in the views.index. But what I need to do is say this from first app import views. So what is that actually doing? It's saying, okay, from that first app folder, import this views.py. And that means here I can say views dot and then call that index function, which remember that index function is inside here, views.py. So that's exactly what's happening here. I'm just saying, okay, from that first app folder, grab views, and then from views, I can call index. And then I will name this. That's the third argument. I'll just say name is equal to index. And remember to put in a comma here to finish off that list. So what this is doing is it's actually mapping that application's view to this URL. So I'm going to save this. Okay, with that saved, let's actually test out to see if this worked by running our server again. And then after that, in the next lecture, we're going to discuss URL mapping in a lot more detail and other ways of doing it. So I'm going to come back up here and say python manage.py run server, hit enter, and then in my browser, I'm going to jump back to this URL. I'm going to just copy this put it in my browser and then let's see if it worked. And you should be doing the same thing. And hopefully if everything worked correctly for you, if I bring in my browser, you should see something that says hello world or whatever text you happen to put into 
that particular view. All right, so we just created our first Django application, very simple hello world, but we were able to create that application, create that view, and actually map it to the URL in the urls.py file. Okay, so coming up next, we're going to discuss a lot more about urls.py, a little more about URL mapping, and some other ways to do it that are going to be a little more efficient and a little better. Thanks everyone, and I will see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome back. It's time for a challenge lecture to put your new skills to the test. We've learned enough now that before we continue to learn more about URL mappings, we should challenge you to make sure you can test out your new skills. I want you to complete the following tasks. First, create a new Django project and call it something like Pro2 or Project2. Then create a new Django application and you can call it App2 or Application2 and this will go inside that new Django project. Then I want you to create an index view inside of that new Django application, and I want you to have it return this line, my second app wrapped in emphasis tags. So note that this is actual HTML code. The reason I'm asking you to do this is because I want you to explore what happens when you actually put a string of HTML code instead of just a normal string. Then I want you to link that view to the urls.py file and run your server to make sure it actually returned that new index view you created. In the next lecture, we're going to go through the steps of this challenge task. Best of luck, I know you already have all the knowledge needed to complete this task, but in case you get stuck on anything, you can refer back to the previous lectures or you can view the upcoming solutions lecture. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the solutions lecture for the Django challenge. What we're going to be doing in this lecture video is just going through the solutions to the previous challenge together. If you were able to figure it all out, then you can go ahead and just skip this lecture. But if you wanted to see the process gone through one more time, feel free to stick around as I go through it. I'm going to jump to the Atom text editor to get started. Okay, here I am at the Atom text editor. Now the first thing we needed to do was actually create a new Django project. So I'll just go ahead and put this under that same My Django Stuff folder that we had earlier. Make sure you change directories so you're matched to it. And then what I will go ahead and do is say Django-admin, whoops. And then I do the starts project command. Hopefully you were able to remember that. And then whatever you want to name the project. In this case, we'll call it something like Pro2. We'll hit enter. And then we can see here that the project two has been created. So under my Django stuff, I have this new Pro2 folder and it's ready to go. Then the next thing I needed to do was actually create an application inside of this Pro2 project. So what I will do is change directory to be inside of Pro2. So I will say CD to Pro2. And now I should be aligned with this manage.py file. So I can call that file and then call start app and create that second app. So I will say python manage.py and then the command I want to call for that is start app and then let's call this something like app2. We create it and we can see we have app2 inside of pro2, that project2. Great. Then the next thing we wanted to do was actually create a view. So I click here on view and here we say create your views here. So let's fill in the needed information. The typical view we've shown you how to do so far requires that HTTP response, and we need to actually import that. We will say from Django.http import HTTP response. And then we'll go ahead and create that index view, which is going to be DEF to create that function, index, and then it takes in a request and remember this can actually be called whatever you want, but by convention it's request. And we will return that HTTP response and pass in some code. And in this case, I actually wanted you to pass in some HTML. So we'll say my second project and then close off that HTML tag, EM. Now obviously you won't be passing in an entire uh, HTML string here for most usual circumstances, but I just wanted to show you what would happen in case you 
wanted to test out the capabilities of Django for this views.py file. So I will save that and then we need to link this new view to our URL. So I come over here to urls.py, scroll down and then we have the URL patterns list. And just like we did last time, I'm going to say from, and in this case, it's going to be app to import views, that views.py file. And then under URL patterns, I'm going to say URL, whoops, let's go ahead and tab that in, URL using regular expression, I'm going to use just like we did last time the caret chevron with the dollar sign. And then as a second argument, let me make sure I only have one single quote there. I will say views dot index. So I call index off of that. And then we'll just give that the name index comma to complete that. And then finally, I need to edit my settings dot pi file under pro two to let the actual project know that my app two application actually exists. So again, we come down here until we see installed apps and I will add in here as an argument that app two, and then I will save this. Then we can actually run our server and make sure everything worked correctly. Let's go ahead and do that. I'll just come down here and I will say Python manage.py run server. Hit enter. Let's make sure everything works out okay. Looks like we're running it here. So I'm going to copy this, put it into my browser, and hopefully we see that string, my second project. And looks like it came out well. I'm going to drag it over. And we can see here we have my second project in italics. So it's actually able to understand that that's HTML when it reports back that view. And what I want you to do is sort of get used to this workflow of creating a project and creating applications. Hopefully you feel comfortable with the few commands that we've learned so far. All right, that's really all there is to this challenge. If you were get, getting stuck on anything or had any questions, feel free to post to the Q&A forums and I'll be happy to help you out there. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to quickly cover some more URL mappings methods. So as we continue on throughout the course, we're going to be dealing with mapping URLs quite a bit. There are several ways of doing this, so I want to briefly touch upon another way. But first off, let's review what we've done in the past. Previously, we showed a very direct mapping that imported the views.py file directly into the urls.py of your project. So you're connecting your views of your application to the urls.py file of the project itself. Now what we want to do is show you the ability of using the include function that you can import from a Django module. The include function allows us to look for a match with regular expressions and link back to our application's own urls.py file. That way, each application has its own urls.py file. As a quick note, we'll have to manually add in this urls.py file because when you start your application, it doesn't automatically create one for you. Unlike when you start your project, it does create the urls.py file for the project. So what we would want to do is add the following to the project's urls.py file. We'll add that first line, which basically imports that include function. And then where it says the URL patterns list that we've worked with before, what we will do is call the URL function from before and then add in a regular expression as a first argument. And basically what this regular expression does is it just says, okay, look at your domain name slash, and then whatever that string is in the first regular expression slash, and then call the app URLs from the include function. And this will all make a lot more sense when we actually code this out later on. But just to touch upon what I just explained, basically what this does, it's allowing us to look for any URL that has this sort of pattern, www.domainname.com slash first underscore app, or whatever you happen to have put there in that first regular expression. In this case, I'm just calling it what the application was called, first underscore app slash. And then if we match that pattern, what happens is the include function basically tells Django, hey, Go look at the urls.py file that's inside of the first app folder, not the urls.py file that's inside of the project. 
And basically this might seem like a lot of work, especially for such a simple mapping, but later on we really want to try to keep our project's urls.py file clean and modular. That way we want to set the reference to the application instead of listing them all in the main urls.py file. So you can easily plug and play with your application since everything is modular now and the URLs are inside the actual application. So let's quickly walk through an example of all of this just to show how it all works. And as a quick note, we've covered everything in part one of Django's official tutorial. So after this lecture, you may want to go visit part one of that official tutorial and browse through it. You can check the resource for a direct link to part one of Django's official tutorial. All right, with that said, let's jump to Adam and actually code out everything that I just explained. Okay, so here we are at Adam. The first thing we wanna do is actually check out our original urls.py file from our first project and import what we need to have there. So previously we just said from first app, import views, and then we called using the URL function, a regular expression here that just said, okay, put in the views.index in case you ever get anything uh, just to the domain name. What we will do now is add in another URL call here and put in a regular expression with an extension of this. And basically what it's going to say is something like first underscore app forward slash, and then we're going to use the include function. In order to use the include function, I need to import it. And I can do from Django dot conf for configuration dot URLs import include. And then with this function, I can actually now just pass this in as a second argument, include, and then I'm going to call my first underscore app dot URLs. And it takes it in as a string. And then finally, I wanna make sure I have a comma here. Okay, let's save that. And then the next thing I wanna do is actually create this urls.py file inside our first application. So I will say, right click on first app, create a new file and call it urls.py and it's going inside that first application I made. And now what we will do is essentially create almost like a mini urls.py file. It's gonna have a lot of the same functionality we just saw earlier. So again, I will say from django.conf.urls import URL, whoops, URL, singular. And then I will also say from first underscore app import views. And then I will say URL patterns is equal to, and I will do another call to URL. And now I'm just going to do a very generic regular expression. So I will just say for basically anything there and I will call views dot, and let's just go ahead and call the index view right now. Later on, we'll test to make sure everything's working by creating a new view. And then I will say name is index. And we can have a comma here, so we can have this on three lines. Then I will just save that. And let's make sure this actually all worked. I'm going to say python, whoops, manage.py, and then run the server. And you have to make sure you're in the correct directory to do this. I'm under that initial first underscore project folder. I'll hit enter, run my server, and let's make sure everything worked. Okay, so we have our server running. Let's copy and paste this. I will copy that and drag it over my Chrome browser. Let me bring that into frame. Here it is, great. So that's what we actually had before. Now what I wanna check to make sure it works is say slash or forward slash first underscore app and then hit enter. And you notice it's working, we still get hello world. And just to prove that this isn't uh, a coincidence or anything, let's do something that we haven't defined, forward slash new page. Hit enter and you will get a 404, this page has not been found. So clearly what we've done is working. We're able to actually direct some extension of our domain into the urls.py of the application. And this is basically what we're trying to get at as an overall idea that I can have the application itself host its own URL patterns that I can then call from the urls.project or urls.py in the first project folder. So again, here, I'm going to use this include functionality and then pass in as a string my application name.urls. And this, we can actually call whatever we want. 
So for instance, let's say something like this. My new extension. And then I will say file save this. And let's go ahead and make sure this uh, updated. I believe it updated right now, but let me just control C and restart it just to make sure everything worked correctly. And then let's bring back in that browser. Okay, so bringing in this browser again. Now let's go ahead and say first underscore app. Hit enter. Great, so that's not working. So now let's actually try in this new extension I just made. So I can say my new extension. Hit enter and we can see it's calling hello world. So all of these basically are calling the same thing. So the main index page, that home page of just the domain name is calling the exact same view of the my new extension page, which we can just for simplicity call first app. It's always a nice idea to try to get these uh, regular expressions to match your application name. That way it's easier to reference so you don't get lost. It won't always happen, but it's a good idea to try to make things, at least in your own mind, readable so when you come back to them later, things make sense to you. But all right, that's all I really wanted to show you for this particular lecture. And again, the main idea here is that the applications can have their own urls.py file that we can then call from the project's URL patterns list. All right, hope you enjoyed that, and I will see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back. In this lecture, we'll be discussing Django templates. Templates are a key part to understanding how Django really works and interacts with your website. Later on, we will learn about how to connect templates with models so that you can display data created dynamically taken straight from your database. However, for now, let's focus on the basics of templates and later on template tags. The template will contain the static parts of an HTML page, parts that are always the same. You can think of it almost as the scaffolding or skeleton of the page. Then there are template tags, which have their own special syntax. This syntax allows you to inject dynamic content that your Django app's views will produce, affecting the final HTML that the user sees. To get started with templates, you first need to create a templates directory and then a subdirectory for each specific app's templates. At least by convention, that's how we're going to do it here. It goes inside of your top level directory. So in our example, we'll have something that looks like this, the first project folder or directory, then we'll create a new templates folder and inside of that, we'll have a first underscore app folder or directory. The next step is to let Django know of the templates by editing the DIR key inside of the templates dictionary in the settings.py file. So inside the settings.py file for the project, there's a variable called templates and it's a dictionary. And inside that dictionary, there's a string, dir, which stands for a directory. And that's what we need to edit to let Django know where the templates are. However, there's an issue with this that we have to deal with before we can actually edit that templates variable. We want our Django project to be easily transferable from one computer to another, but the dir or directory key is going to really require a hard-coded file path. And that means we're going to have a conundrum. We can't really hard code a file path with our username if we want to easily share this project or application with other users. And then we have the whole issue of different operating systems. Someone using a Mac isn't going to be able to use the same file path settings as someone using a Windows computer. So the question is, how do we actually resolve this? Well, this is where the power of Python comes into play. We can use Python's OS module to dynamically generate the correct file path strings regardless of whosever computer you're using or whatever operating system you're using. If you want to check this out, you can import OS with Python and then try out something like the following, print underscore underscore file underscore underscore or print os.path.dirname and then pass in that file tag. And we're going to actually show you examples of this right when we're done with this presentation. But we're going to be using this OS module to feed the path to the dir key inside of that templates dictionary. Once we've done that, we can create an HTML file called index.html inside of the template's first app directory. Inside this HTML file, we will insert template tags along with normal HTML. And these template tags are also sometimes known as Django template variables. These template variables will allow us to inject content into the HTML directly from Django. 
Now, as a quick note, these template tags can be a little intimidating for beginners. And the reason for that is because they don't look exactly like HTML, and they don't look exactly like Python either. They're kind of this new pseudo mix between the two. So they're a little intimidating at first, and you may find them confusing when you're first dealing with them. But don't worry, we're going to be working with them often enough that by the end of this course, you'll feel really comfortable calling template tags. So as a quick note, don't be intimidating if you see this thing come out of nowhere, but we will have a full understanding of template tags as we progress through the course. And we'll start off slow and steady so you can get comfortable with them in your own time. So this is now starting to really reveal the power of why we should even be using a web framework. Django will be able to inject content into the HTML, which means we can later on use Python code to inject content from a database, which we'll learn about when we learn about models with Django. In order to achieve all of this, what we will use is a new function called the render function and place it into our original index function inside of our views.py file that we've been working with. So I know I've been talking a lot, so let's now actually jump to the Atom text editor and code through everything that we just discussed. All right, here I am back at the Atom text editor. Now, before we get started actually creating our templates, what I want to do is quickly talk again about those dynamic paths. Using Python's OS module, to actually generate dynamic paths so you don't have to worry about giving this file to a computer that's on another operating system. What we can do here is under first project, first project, open up our settings.py file. And you'll notice that actually at the top, import OS has already been imported for you. And there's a base directory. And this basically builds the paths inside of the project. And if we actually just run this file, we can explore what these file paths actually are. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to change the directory to first project. That way I'm under first project, first project. And then right now I will say Python settings.py. Hit enter. And we shouldn't see any output because we're not printing anything out. So we can run it. Now let's actually print stuff out and explore what it actually is. We'll start off with this file. And this is essentially just a special key indicating the settings.py file. So if I save this and run it now, I get settings.py as my file output. So that's the actual file. And now let's print out this, the uh, os.path.absolutepath to this. So I can just copy and paste this from here. Copy that. And then paste it here. Save this. And now let's run that. And here we can see it printed out my actual full file path. So here I'm under C, users, my name, desktop, my Django stuff, first project, first project, settings.py. And this is the sort of thing we're going to be using to actually feed in file paths. So we will feed them in directly from Python instead of typing out something like this. And then finally, we can see what this base dir is. So this whole thing has been set up as a variable already conveniently for us, so we can use it later. I'm going to save this and then actually just print out base directory. And we can see here when we print out the base directory, it prints out the directory that leads directly to the first project. So this most upper directory. With this base underscore directory variable, we can use it to conveniently call our new templates directory that we're about to create. Let's first create that directory and then show you how you can create the template directory. Under the top directory of first project, I will right click and then add in a new folder, and I will call this folder templates, all lowercase. And here I can see I have a new templates folder. Right now, it's empty. And then I can use this base directory and add onto it templates. Now, you may be tempted to do something like this as a simple add-on, maybe backslash and then templates. But that's actually not going to work for many reasons. One is stuff may be treated as an escape character, and two, this isn't going to work for all operating systems. If you're on a Linux or Mac, maybe your forward slashes will go the other way, etc. So what you're going to do is use os.path.join to actually join these two. So we're going to put a comma here. And now instead of calling print, I will call os.path.join. And this will actually join these two together. And let's show you what that looks like when I say print. I'm going to save this and then run settings.py again. And here I can see the full directory for my local machine to that templates folder. And in this case, I'm not actually going to print this, but actually save this 
as a new variable. And this variable is going to be called template underscore dir. So template underscore dir. So that's the template directory. Let's save that. And then we're going to edit the directory. So if we scroll down here, still in the settings.py, I'm going to go past the installed apps, go past the middleware, and here under templates, I'm going to pass in for the directory. So remember, this is just a, essentially a dictionary type object. And here's this key, directories. Inside of it, I will pass in that template underscore dr variable we just made. And we can put in a comma there and then save this. All right, so here we have everything set up, ready to go, with the paths going to be concatenated correctly. Now let's move on to the next step of actually adding a template. Within our template directory, we're going to right-click, put in a new file, and we will call this file index.html. And inside of this, I will just put in my regular HTML code, and we can set this title to be something like first app, save that, and then we're actually going to put in a little bit of information here in the body. We'll put in a header and say something like, hello, this is index.html. Save that, and then we're gonna show you what a template tag looks like. And to make it really obvious how it's going to work, we'll give it a, a name that makes it very clear. So as far as the syntax for a template tag, at least the very first one we're gonna do, you have essentially two sets of these curly brackets on each side, and then the actual variable you're going to pass in. In this case, we'll call this variable insert underscore me, so that we can actually see that we're inserting stuff using Django. So I'm going to save this. Again, very simple HTML file, except what might be a little confusing is this template tag right now. And don't worry if you find it a little intimidating because it's kind of weird and new. We will see this more and more as we go throughout the course. Now what we need to do is actually connect this variable, insert me, to our actual project and our application. And the way we're going to do that is by editing the views.py file of our first underscore app. So we will come here to views.py, and here we have the index, it takes in a request, returns an HTTP response, hello world. Instead, what we're going to do now is notice we have from Django.shortcuts import render. That should already be there by default, but if you don't have it, go ahead and type that in. And now what we will do is actually edit this function. And we're going to say something like this. We'll say, create a dictionary, and we will call it my underscore dictionary, or whatever you want to call it. And then here, this is the importance part, we'll have a key value pair. And in this case, we need this key to match the variable that we created over in that template tag. So in that case, it was insert me. And we'll just have it be a string and say something like, Hello, I am from views.py. We will save that, and then we're going to return, and this is where we can actually use the render function. And in this case, for the render function, we're going to pass in, it takes in the request, and then it takes in as a string where you actually want to show this. So again, that first parameter is just really the template we wish to use. And then the next thing I need to add in is the actual file itself, index.html. And then here as a third argument is the context. And this is basically going to link up what we're passing in here to our index.html file. And we're actually going to change this in a little bit. We'll create a subdirectory, but I'll explain that right after we test this out to make sure it all worked. So here, whoops, that shouldn't be a string. We'll pass in that dictionary we just created. And then we will save all of this. And now let's actually make sure this all worked out and then we'll explain it and show you why you should edit this just a little bit by actually referencing the specific application. So let's run this, make sure it all worked out and then we're gonna explain and do a little quick review. So I'm going to back out of CD and under first project, I will say Python manage.py run the server. Hit enter and it looks like our server is running. So let's just copy and paste this. And as always, I'll bring in my browser. And then bringing in my browser over here, look what we get. We say, hello, this is index.html. And then we say, hello, I am from views.py. So we have the original header that is from index.html. 
If we look at index.html, we would find it there. And then we see this little message, hello, I am from views.py. So this is pretty much the amazing part of what we're doing here. We are actually inserting using Django. We say, hello, I'm from views.py, and using that template tagging, I can then pass that in. Now, a quick note, what we want to do is actually separate out our templates per application. So what I should do is this. Under my templates, I'm going to create a new folder and name it after my application, first app. And then I will move index.html into first app. And that way we keep our code modular. And the next thing I have to do is come back to views.py. And here I will call first underscore app. And then actually call the index there. And this slash should actually go the other way. And this slash is okay to go that way because this is basically what your browser is going to be reading. So we will save that. And let's check it again, make sure everything worked. And let's go ahead and just to make sure everything worked, change this. So say something like, now I am coming from, coming from first app index.html. Save this and let's bring in that back that browser, make sure it all worked. And I just refreshed the page and now I see this. Now I'm coming from first app index.html. Okay, great. Looks like everything worked out and our templates are good to go. So let's break down everything we just did real quickly just so we get a full understanding of how the basics of templates work. I'm going to minimize this. All right, the first thing we had to do was create essentially our templates directory. And inside that templates directory, you should create a directory for each application. And then inside of that is where your actual HTML files are going to go. And later on, we'll see how to incorporate things such as JavaScript and CSS. Because we created this templates directory, we need to let settings.py know about it. And the way we did this is we took advantage of a couple things. One was the import OS and Python's operating system. And then we had the template directory. And we used Python's OS module to say os.path.join and join the space directory to that templates that we just created. And you'll always want to use os.path.join instead of something more manual. That way this code can run on any operating system. Once we've done that, we come back here to views and we learned how to use import render, which is something we're going to be using a lot more often than just a simple HTTP response. And then with the render function, we can create a dictionary. And this dictionary is then going to have the actual content that we want to inject into that index HTML. And it takes in the key. And this key is going to be the variable that we pass into that template tag. In this case, we just called it insert me to make it really obvious. And now here, I say now I'm coming from first app index, etc. And in the render, we pass in the request, pass in the actual HTML, and then for the context, we pass in this dictionary, and then it will read in the keys when it actually wants to inject stuff into this index.html file. All right, now I know that was certainly a lot and a lot of new things, but don't worry, as we continue on throughout this course, this is going to feel more and more comfortable for you. Okay, hope you enjoyed that lecture, and I will see you in the next one. Hello everyone and welcome back. In this lecture you have a challenge and it's a Django templates challenge. Templates is a big leap forward for us, so it's a good time to quickly get some practice using them. And we're going to be using your older Pro 2 project that you created for the previous Django challenge. If you don't have that project anymore, just quickly recreate it using the creating project commands and the creating application commands that we've learned in previous lectures. Once you have that set up, you want to go ahead and complete the following tasks. Create a templates directory and connect it to the settings.py file of that new second project. Then create a new view called help and use the URL mapping to render it for any page with the extension slash help. So again, you're going to go to your second project folder, create that second new application, create a new view, so a function within that views.py file, and use the URL mapping that we've learned to actually create a rendering for any page with the extension slash help. And then I want you to use template tags to return help page. So in the templates directory that you made, create a new folder. And within that folder, there should be something like help.html. And then that should have template and template tags that basically returns help page. So just get everything connected so that it's clear that you understand how to use templates to connect to a view and actually inject code into the template HTML.
All right, best of luck with that. And in the next lecture, we will briefly code through the solution. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you there. Hello everyone, and welcome back. In this lecture, we'll be coding through the solutions for the Django templates challenge. Let's quickly review what we had to do. We wanted to create a templates directory and connect it to the settings.py file. So we'll tackle that first. Then we wanted to create a new view called help and use URL mapping to render it for any page with the extension slash help. And then we wanted to add template tags to return something like help page. Okay, let's jump to the Atom text editor and accomplish all these tasks. Okay, here I am at the Atom text editor. To start off, let's create that templates directory. So I can just right click on Pro2, add a new folder, call it templates, and then hit enter. And then inside of this, I'm going to do a subdirectory for my application. In this case, we'll just use app2. You could have also created a new application for this, whatever made more sense to you. And let's call this app2. Again, I wouldn't have been surprised if you did something like help and created a new directory, an application called help. But for right now, we have templates and app2 created. Now let's go to our pro2 or project2 settings file and sync up this templates directory to our actual settings. Remember, we use the convenient import OS command to actually do this. So I will create something that looks like this. We'll say template directory, and I will say os.path.join, and I will join my base directory with templates. Great. And then I have to scroll down to my actual list, pass installed apps, pass middleware, and then here in templates, this list has a dictionary inside of it. And under DIRs for directories, I want to just say template underscore DIR and then save this. All right, great. Now let's continue on. The next thing we want to do is sync up and map the URLs. And in order to do this, we have to do a couple things. First off, I want to do what we've done in the previous mappings URLs lecture, where we actually have each application have its own URLs.py file. So I will right click on app2, create a new file, and I will call it URLs.py. And that goes inside app2, which is inside project2. And then here what I will do is the following. I'll say from Django-conf-urls import URL. And then I will also say from app2 import views. And we haven't actually created the help view yet, but we will in just a second. And then finally, we'll have our own URL patterns list here. And inside of this list, I'm going to call the URL function that we just imported and then pass in something that looks like this. We'll put some regular expression here. And then I will say views dot, and in this case, we've previously done index, but I wanted to create a new view called help. I haven't done it yet, but I will. So we'll call views.help there, and we'll give it the name help. And then let's save that. And now let's go to our actual URLs.py file of project2 and connect this URLs to this URLs. So we'll scroll down, and here we have the URL patterns for the entire project. So let's connect this to our actual URLs.py that's inside of our application. And in order to do this, remember we need to import the include function. So I will say from, again, django.conf.urls. I could have actually put this up here, so there's no need to really write this twice, but I just want to make it really clear what we're doing. I'll put in include. And again, I could have just done something like comma include here. That would have been the same thing. But just to make it clear, I'm going to put it in as a new line. Save that. And then we have our index page. We have admin. But let's add in something else here. We'll say URL. And using regular expressions, I'm going to say chevron or caret. And I will say help. And then I will say include. And I will call app to dot urls comma to finish that list and save that and then a couple things we have to still do is actually create that view and then create the html that we call for that view so coming back to views in app2 right now i have this index view but let's create a new one called help and it will take in a request 
And then there's something we still need to add to this, which is actual use of that render. So I'm going to make a dictionary. We'll call this help dictionary, or really whatever you want to call it. And then I create a dictionary, and we'll call this help insert. And as the value for that key, we'll just say help page, just to make it really clear. And then I'm going to return the render function, taking in that request, realizing that it goes with app2, and we'll say help.html. So what that's actually calling is over here, this template that we're about to create. And then the context of this that we actually inject using the template tagging is going to be this help dictionary. Okay, save that. And then finally, last step is to actually create that HTML file. So we'll say new file, and this will be help.html. Hit enter. I'll say HTML here. Title, we'll say something like help page. And then finally, let's actually insert using template tags. So hopefully right now you realize the most basic template tags is just the double brackets, those double curly brackets on each side. And then we want to actually insert the dictionary that we created, that context. And something to keep in mind that we're not actually inserting the dictionary, but the key of that dictionary. So if we go back to our page here, under views, we want to import this help insert. So sometimes a common mistake is to accidentally put in help dictionary, but you should really be putting in this variable right here, help insert. So I will copy that and come back to help here and paste that in. All right. So that was a lot of steps. Let's hopefully make sure it all worked out. I'm going to say here under project two, Python, manage.py, run server, hit enter. And if we did everything right, we should be able to copy this URL and paste it into our browser. Let me bring that browser over. And here we have our browser. It says my second project. That makes sense. That's the index page that we set up previously. But now let's test this out and write help, and you notice we get the help page. So it takes in the template tag that we inserted and it looks it up. And we can see also help page here, that's the title that we inserted here. So just to clarify, this help page up here on the top, that's from the title. This help page is HTML text is coming in from that template tagging of help underscore insert. All right, if you were having trouble with this, then I really suggest that you take the time to review the previous lectures on template tagging and setting that up and trying another shot at this exercise. This is definitely a big leap forward and it's really important that you have this foundation of connecting the templates and the views together. Because coming up next, we're gonna learn how to connect this to models to your actual database. All right, hope you enjoyed that little challenge and I will see you at the next lecture. Thanks everyone. Hello everyone and welcome back. In this lecture, we'll be discussing Django with static files and we'll learn how to insert static media files. So far, we've used templates and template tagging to insert just simple text. But we don't always just want text. What about other types of media? For example, returning a user's photo. Let's go ahead and discuss static media files. We're not yet at the point where we can connect to a database, grab a user's photo, and then insert it but we are at a point where we can just grab a static media file and serve it to whoever happens to visit the page. To do this, we're going to create a new directory inside of the project called static, just like we did for templates. Then we're going to add this directory path to the project settings.py file. Then we will also add a static URL variable, very similar process to what we did with templates. Once we've done all that, we need a place to store our static image files. So, Underneath the static directory, we'll go ahead and make a new directory called images. And you can go ahead and place a favorite JPEG file inside this images directory, or just download one off the internet. Then to test that this all worked, once we've set it up, we should be able to go to a URL that looks like this. It'll be your domain, slash static, slash images, and you should be able to pick up whatever picture you happen to save there. And that will allow us to confirm that the paths are set up and connected properly. But what we really want to do is set up a template tag for this. So that line right there shows us that we have everything connected, but then we're going to learn how to actually inject that static media image using template tags. 
And to do this inside an HTML file, we need to add in a few specific tags. So at the top of that HTML file, we're going to add this load static files, which basically tells Django to load up the static files. But keep in mind, this line right here is going to go after that doc type HTML line. So that doc type HTML that's automatically created when we create an HTML file, um, make sure that always goes at the top, otherwise you may get errors. And we'll walk you through this when we actually code this out. Then what we're going to also do is insert the image with an HTML image source. So as you remember from the HTML lectures, when we're actually inserting an image into HTML, we use this image tag. But in this case, for the source, we're not going to provide a file path. Instead, we're going to use template tags to actually inject static and then call the part of the file path we need. In this case, it'll just be images pic.jpg or whatever your picture happens to be called. And this will all make a lot more sense when we actually code this out. Now, a quick thing to notice is how this template tag, those curly bracket percent sign, is a little different than the double set of curly brackets. We're going to be discussing and showing these differences more clearly in future lectures, but for right now, just consider those double curly brackets as being used for simple text injection. And we can actually use these curly bracket percent sign template tags for a lot more complex injections and actual logic. Later on, you'll see how we can actually write a for loop using those template tags inside our HTML file. Okay, let's code through an example of serving up a static image, and afterwards we can dive into models and databases by moving on to Django level two. I'm going to jump to the Atom text editor to get started. All right, so here I am at the Atom text editor. The first thing I wanna do is just like we did with templates, I'm going to create a new folder called static. So I will right click the top level directory of first project, click new folder or new directory, call it static. And then inside of this static, I'm going to do another folder and then call it something like images. And now we have the directory, first project, static, images. Really similar to what we did for the templates first app. Let me collapse some of these things. All right, the next thing we have to do is tell Django where to actually find static images. In this case, we edit the settings.py file, just like we did with templates. So really similar process here. And then just like we did with templates, we're going to use the os.path.join, but we'll add a little more to it. In this case, we will create a new variable and call it something like static underscore dir for the directory for the static. And then we will say os.path.join. And I'm going to join that base directory just like we did last time with the string static. So that leads just to this static folder here. And then later on, we can call images when we're actually dealing with our template tags. So this basically provides that absolute path to the location of that static folder inside of our project. All right, so the next step is to scroll all the way down in your settings.py file. And you should notice something that mentions static files right here. And it also has a really nice link to the documentation on how to actually set up static files. And you see that we already have basically a pre-built variable, static URL, leading to static. And that just allows you to use that for convenience. But what we want to do is add in another variable that will actually be able to take in a list of static file directory paths. And basically the reason for this is when you're dealing with your own applications and your own projects, for this static folder, you may not want something so simple as just static images. You may actually want to take the approach we did with templates and have each application have its own special folder and then within that folder put in your images. So this may have been static first app images. So just to keep that in mind, let's show you how you can actually create a variable that will be the static files directory. So we'll do something like static files, all caps, underscore, D-I-R, S, so static file directories, is equal to, and then this is going to be a list. And here is where we're going to pass in that variable we made earlier. If we scroll all the way back to the top, or close to the top, this static directory, which is just joining the base directory of that static folder. So coming all the way back down, we will pass in here static directory. And we can put a comma there to make sure that works with the multiple lines. As a quick note, you should always check to make sure that 
this static files underscore dirs variable doesn't already exist. Sometimes uh, some boilerplate code will already have it placed there for you, so you'll want to check. And it's possible that in future versions of Django, they will actually uh, create this as an empty list to begin with when you generate a new project. So keep that in mind. You should always check to make sure you're not overwriting a variable or double defining it. Otherwise, you're going to get confused and Django will also get confused. So let's keep on going. The next thing I want to do is to actually place some sort of JPEG file inside of this uh, images folder. So I'm going to do that. I'll do that through just Windows Explorer, or if you're on a Mac, do that with Finder. So let me jump to doing that. All right, so I just did that through the Finder. Uh, you weren't able to see it because I was doing it on another monitor, but as a quick little note, if I bring in my browser here, I just downloaded this uh, picture of Django. Um, this is the actual guitarist that Django is named after, Django Reinhardt. And then I put it into the images. So go ahead and put in whatever JPEG file you want there. And I'll just put in uh, Django for that. Okay, let's go ahead and continue. And with everything we have now, we should be able to actually test out and run the server. Before we do, I just want to quickly review uh, what these three variables you created are in the settings.py file. So scrolling back up here, this static directory is just using the Python OS module to actually join the base directory to static. And then scrolling all the way down to the very bottom, we have the static file variables. We have static underscore URL. And if you're using an older version of Django, make sure you manually place that in. 1.9 and above should have done this automatically for you. And you want to make sure you have the forward slashes uh, both at the beginning and the end of that string. So definitely scroll all the way down and make sure that's already been placed for you. If not, go ahead and copy this static underscore URL equals that string of static. And then we have the static files underscore the IRS and that list. And basically what's happening is the two variables that we created, static dir and static files underscore dir, refer to locations on this computer where static files are being stored. And then that final variable that was already here, that static underscore URL, is just going to allow us to specify the URL with which static files can be accessed when we're actually running our Django server. So for example, when you're actually running the server, someone could go to your domain name slash static slash and get access to static content if they're on the client side. And later on, we can add protections to make sure no, not everyone can just go and grab static content. But let's just test this and make sure everything's working out. I can do that just by saying Python. Actually, let's CD into first project first. And now I say Python manage.py run server, hit enter. And it looks like it's running. Like I've done before, I will just copy this and bring it into my browser. So bringing in my browser, I can see here the previous stuff we've worked on for the first project. Hello, this is index.html, and now I'm coming from first app index. But what I want to do now is actually get to that static image. So I will say this, static images slash, and then type in djangoguitar.jpg or whatever your JPEG file happens to be named. And here we have it, the picture of Django. And now what we want to do is actually use template tagging to inject this image into an HTML file. So as a user, you're not going to be directly sifting through the static images just to find a JPEG. What we want to do is show this as if it was just a normal HTML page that happened to have this image injected into it. So let's work on doing that. So coming back to our templates page over here, we have our first app and then we have that index HTML. So now let's call this something like Django guitar page, save that. And then I will say, hi, this is a picture of Django himself. And then we want to actually use template tagging for the injection or inserting that actual material. So I'm going to delete this insert me. Remember that was from the previous view that we were working with earlier. And below this doc type HTML, I want to load static files. And that basically allows Django to know, hey, we need to load some static files here. And that 
will save you time if you don't need to load static files. That way you're not just always loading them. So we'll say load static files. Okay, and again, notice the different type of template tagging I'm using here. So as a quick note, I mentioned this in the presentation, but you always want to make sure that the very first line is this one, doc type HTML. Otherwise, the HTML code is going to get confused. Then the next thing we want to do is to actually put in an image tag that will have the picture of Django. So let's do that. We have an image, and the source we want to do is where we use the template tagging again. So typically, what we were doing in the HTML section of the course is we were actually just hard coding the path in there. But now, since we're using Django, we can actually use template tagging to essentially inject the image. So I'm going to say, OK, this is static. And then as a string, I'm going to say it's under images slash and my one is called Django guitar dot JPEG. That's what my file is called. And then finally, I want to close that off. And you may want to have something like an alternative here. That's what ALT stands for. So in case for some reason you're not able to load that JPEG, it's always a good idea to have some sort of alternative there. So we can say like something like, uh-oh, didn't show. So that way we can see at least something to know we accidentally weren't able to link this correctly. So it's always a good idea to have an alternative there. Now let's check in back with our server and make sure this actually all worked. I'm going to grab my browser again and I will bring it over. And notice right now my file path is at static images Django guitar.jpg. If I delete all of this and go back to my home page, that index page, hit enter, here I have the actual whoops view I was doing. Bring that guy back up. And here he is, just on the index page says, hi, this is a picture of Django himself, and we were able to actually inject that image there, so that static file. And as another quick note, I know I've been talking a lot about injecting static images, but static files don't just have to be images. They can actually be uh, basically any static file that's not going to change. And that includes things like CSS and JavaScript. So those can be two files that are underneath your static folder that aren't going to change. And let me show you an example of what that would actually look like. So I'm going to exit this, and under static, let's make a new folder and call it something like CSS. And I'm going to make a new file here and call it, I don't know, my mystyle.css. And here, let's just give a quick style tag to header one. That way we know it's actually working which means I'm going to say something like h1 for header one. And then let's just make it obvious. We will put the color here as something like red. And then I'm going to save this. So here I have my style.css. It's inside my static folder. So static CSS, my style.css. And hopefully you can begin to get an idea of the power of templates, right? Like I mentioned earlier, they're a skeleton or scaffolding and you're going to inject stuff. And because it's a skeleton or scaffolding, you can reuse them over and over again and just change things slightly depending on the situation. And you can call different static files into them. But right now I have that CSS. So let's go back to that index.html under templates and show you how you can actually now call template tagging to insert the static file that's not an image, but an actual CSS file which means back up here in the head of the HTML document, I want to make sure I've already loaded static files, and then I'm going to create a link, and it will be a style sheet with the href. In this case, I'm going to remove this string and replace it with some template tags. And I'm going to be using the percent sign because I'm not just injecting simple text. And then I call static and then pass in the string of where that CSS is actually based inside of that static folder. So underneath static directory, I have the CSS directory. And then underneath that, I want to call mystyle.css. And let's close off that tag and make sure it's all working. And as a quick note, this should also be wrapped as a string, which is why I wasn't looking correct earlier. Whoops. 
Okay, so I have a string within a string. So these little tags here have those ready to go. Then we have static, and we have this string inside of that. Let's save this and restart our server to make sure it's actually picking up on that style. So I'm gonna bring back in that browser. And if I bring it back in, we should see that the header has now turned red. And that's the case. Hi, this is a picture of Django himself. And we're actually connecting now a static CSS file. Perfect. So we've learned a lot of the power of static files and being able to inject them with template tags. So kind of a two for one here. How do you use template tags that actually uh, perform some sort of logic or inject something that's not just simple text? And then also how to deal with static images and static files. All right, so hopefully out of this lecture, you're really beginning to understand the sort of workflow that develops with Django, that you're creating a project, creating applications, linking views to URLs, uh, dealing with the settings file in the way you need to, and then more than just injecting a simple static image, actually linking static using uh, template tags into whatever HTML files you're working with. So hopefully you get an idea of the sort of workflow we're gonna be developing as we move on to larger and larger projects. All right, that is it for Django level one. Coming up in Django level two, we're gonna learn about this basically third piece of the puzzle, which is models and databases. So a lot of times Django is known as an MTV framework with models, templates, and views. And so far we've only learned about templates and views. It's time to get in that third puzzle piece with models and connect everything here to an actual database. All right, thanks everyone, and I will see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to Django level two. Now that you've reached level two, let's quickly review the previous topics from Django level one. Those topics were setting up projects and applications, creating views and mapping URLs to those views, using simple templates and tags, and then serving static media files. In this lecture, we will do a run through of the workflow aspects we've learned about so far to get a quick review on all those topics. And we're going to be using the two project folders from Django level one for Django level two. If you accidentally deleted those folders or don't have them anymore, you can always get them from the downloaded notes. Okay, in level two, we'll begin to discuss models and databases and how to use them with Django. And we're also going to be discussing how to use the admin interface. Before we do that though, let's get started with a quick overview of Django level one. And then in the next lecture, we'll get started with the Django level two topics. I'm going to hop over to the editor now. All right, here I am at the editor. I have a new folder called Django lectures that I've been working with before. And basically what we're going to do here is just do a very quick run through of all the topics we did in Django level one. Won't be doing a whole lot of explanation, just kind of a general run through of the workflow you should be used to by now. So first things first, we want to start a project. So I will say Django admin call start project and then name the actual project. I'm going to be using the same names we used in Django level one. Feel free to change them. But here I'll just call it like we did in Django level one, first project. So I say Django admin, start project, first project, and then I get a new folder here with first project, the project folder, settings, URLs, and then manage.py. Great. Now the next thing we have to do is actually create the application. To do that, I'm going to CD into that first project file, and then I will call Python, call the manage.py file, and then off of that, I will call start app, and I'll call my first application first app, just like we did in Django level one. Again, you can change the name. And here we have first app. Great. And then what I'm going to be doing is messing around with the views.py file, the urls.py file in first project, and then also I need to create a urls.py file for first app, and then we'll also do some template folders, etc. But let's continue on. Let's create a view. So I will open up views.py, and I have from django.shortcuts import render. And we initially started with the HTTP response view, but we'll use render here. And I will call def, and we'll just do an index view. So at the request, and let's put a dictionary here so we can also practice those template tags. I'll say my dictionary, and then we'll say insert content, or whatever you want to call it. And then say, hello, I'm from first app. And then we will call return render and into the render function I'll pass in that request and then I'm also going to pass in 
the first underscore app slash index.html. And we'll need to set that up. And then I'll also call the actual context to be equal to that context dictionary, which was that my dictionary file. So we'll save that. And the next things I have to do is set up the actual index.html file and then set up the URL mappings. We'll do the double URL mappings, basically create a URL mapping call in first project to go to the urls.py file inside first app. So I'll say a new file inside first app, call it urls.py, and then I'm going to say from django.configuration or conf urls import the URL function. And then I will say from first underscore app import views. So that views.py file. I'll create a list called URL patterns. And then inside of this list, I'm going to have the URL function call and I'll use regular expressions just to indicate that this is essentially at the index. And then we'll say views.index. So I actually call that index and then we'll say name is equal to index. So remember this views.index right here, that's just, uh, if I go to views.py, that's this function call right here. Okay, so I have the urls.py working inside of my application, but then I need to fix my first project urls.py to make sure that's going to call it correctly. So let's scroll all the way down here. And right now I have the basic admin, but I'm going to add to this. And I want to do it with the include function that we learned about. So I import that from django.configuration.urls. So I will say just comma include. And then over here, I'm going to add in, we'll say URL. And I can even do something like first underscore app to take care of those file paths. Really, you can kind of play around with this. And then we'll say include, and I will say first underscore app dot URLs. So let's save that. And then let's also just add in the view for the actual index page. So we'll say R, and then I will say regular expression, those caret signs. And let's add in the single quote there. So that's all wrapped. I'll call views dot index and then say name index. So that's kind of just showing what we did last time here. Let's put a comma there, save this. And what's nice about this is if you ever feel forgetful about uh, these different methods here that I'm showing, you can just scroll up and the Django, the default urls.py file actually has the instructions. So it tells you how to do the function view, which we kind of just showed this views.home name is equal to home. That was the very first example here for the name main index page. Class-based views, we're gonna talk about that later on. But then we also have the URL configuration, which we just showed here with that include function. So anything with the first app goes to the first app.urls. And then next what we wanna do is set up those template files. So I'm going to create a new file under first project. So we'll say new file, we will call it templates. And oh, whoops, I meant folder. My apologies here, move that to trash create a new folder called templates, hit enter, and then inside of this create another folder that shares your application name. In my case, we'll keep the application name the same to be first app. So I expand templates, I expand first app, that way I can start finding it. And inside of this, I'm going to create that actual index.html. So I will say new file here, index.html. And there's my index.html file. And we can also link it to CSS or those static images that we showed from Django level one. So let's walk through those very basic examples. I'm going to start typing HTML. We'll say hello for the title. And then I'm going to leave this. And inside the body, I'll put a heading one that says, hello, this is a test page. And then let's actually show how we can import some stuff. And since it's just text, what I'm going to do is say inside of this, we'll put it inside heading two, create those template tags, and then call whatever the actual key was. So if I come back to views, it was insert content. So I'll come back here and then just put in insert 
content, save it. It's nice that Adam is helping me out there as well. And then the last thing we need to do to make sure this all actually works is we need to fix the settings file, or not fix, but add to the settings file so we have all the directories. So that way I know where my templates are. And we also created static directories earlier, but we won't show how to do the static file since it's almost the same as the, the template file. So we'll say it's going to be the base directory, and then we'll say template, since that's the name of our templates folder. Okay, save that, that looks good. And then let's scroll down and make sure it's in the actual DIRs key. So if we scroll all the way down, here we have DIRs, let's say template, DIR, comma, save. Okay, so now let's test this all out by actually saying python manage.py run server. So let's make sure this is saved. Come over here, say python manage.py run server. Hit enter, and we might get those errors on the migrations. It says views is not defined. Let's make sure everything's okay. Okay, that error actually makes sense because we forgot to just import over here in urls.py. So I come to urls.py and I should have imported this. So I will say from first app import views. Save that. And now let's try again. It's performing a system check. What's nice is it kind of automatically uh, keeps trying. Let's copy and paste this into our browser and make sure it works. I'm going to then bring my browser over. And there it is. It says, hello, this is a test page. Hello, I'm from first app. Great. Looks like it's all working. And what you will also notice is because we didn't actually change any of the content here, I also say, if I say slash first app and I hit enter, I get the same result. Hello, this is a test page. Hello, I'm from first app. But the basic way, it still is working the same. I was able to successfully connect uh, first app and the index page to the first app.urls. And what's basically the only view in that is this index request. Okay, hopefully that was um, pretty good for you as a review and you have a full understanding of everything we just did. Now I wouldn't expect you to kind, of, kind of zoom through it just like we did right now, but hopefully you understand all the steps that we did. And you can see that even with myself uh, running through it this fast, I kind of slipped up on that forgetting to import views.py. But other than that, it should be kind of straightforward as far as your workflow. The very next chunk of all of this is to actually connect models and databases and then check out the admin. All right, thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Django Models Lecture. In this lecture, we're going to be covering the main concepts behind models, databases, and how Django works with them. We won't actually be doing any live coding in this lecture, we're just going to be looking at concepts through slides. So make sure you have enough time to just fully enjoy this lecture and the concepts, and then in the next lecture we're going to code through a lot of the stuff we talk about here. All right. An essential part of any website is the ability to accept information from a user and input it into a database. Then later on, retrieve information from a database and use it to generate content for the user. We use models to incorporate a database into a Django project. And Django comes equipped with SQLite, which is a SQL engine. SQLite will work with us for our simple examples. We won't be doing any huge websites. So it should be totally fine, but Django can also connect to a variety of SQL engine backends. It can connect to PostgreSQL, MySQL, and all you have to do is just switch out the actual engine. And we'll talk about that later on. But for most of our projects, SQLite is more than enough. In the settings.py file, you can edit the engine parameter used for databases, and that's where you would actually connect to a different backend if you didn't want to use SQLite. Then to create an actual model, we use a class structure inside of the relevant applications models.py file, which we haven't actually edited yet, but we will in the next lecture. This class object will be a subclass of Django's built-in class, django.db.models.model. So basically you're going to inherit from this built-in model class. Then each attribute of the class represents a field, which is just like a column name with constraints in SQL. This will all feel very natural if you already have some SQL experience. But in case you don't, let's quickly review what a SQL database looks like. And if you already have SQL experience, you can just kind of fast forward through this little explanation. Okay, so basically SQL operates like a giant table. If you're familiar with Excel or spreadsheets in general, SQL operates in a very similar fashion with each column representing a field and each row representing an individual entry or data point. 
So here we can see a table has a website ID, a website name, and then a URL. So each column has a type of field as well, such as a character field, an integer field, or a date field. And each field can also have constraints. So here we have website ID, and that's an integer field. Then we have website name, that's a character field, etc. And for those kind of a constraints, for example, the character field should have a max length constraint, indicating the maximum number of characters allowed. So you have the type of field and then constraints on that field. The last thing to note is table or models with Django, the relationships between them, and often models will reference each other. For this referencing to work, we use the concepts of foreign keys and primary keys. So let's show an example. Imagine we now have two models, which are essentially two databases, one to store website information and another to store date information. So here on the left, we have the website ID, the website name, and the URL. On the right, we have the corresponding website ID and then date accessed. So we could say that the website ID column is a primary key in the left table and a foreign key in the right table. A primary key is a unique identifier for each row in a table. A foreign key just denotes that the column coincides with a primary key of another table. Later on, we're going to move on to discuss things like one-to-one -one or many-to-many -many relationships. But for now, this is all we really need to know. That should be enough for our understanding of models in Django and just a general quick overview of what SQL kind of looks like as a concept. Now let's show an example of the models class that would go into the models.py file of your application. So as I mentioned, we have these model classes and they inherit from Django's built-in models.model class. So let's imagine we have a topic model. We would have the class topic and then we can say top name is going to be models. The type of field, character field, and then as arguments, you pass in these parameters that are constraints. So we say what the max length is. Does every topic name have to be true or unique, I should say? And we can set that unique equal to true. Then we have, let's say, another model for a web page. And essentially, each of these classes is going to act like a table in your database. And then we have category, name, URL. And then we say models, that foreign key, the character field, the URL field. So those are all different fields. And then you can pass in parameters. But note here, how the category equals to models that foreign key, and then we pass in topic there because that's going to be a foreign key from the topics model. Then we can have a web page model where we have the topic, again, it's a foreign key, the name, which is a character field, and then URL models that URL field. And we can then have a specific method to return the actual name. So if you say print web page, it grabs the name. And after we set up the models, we can migrate the database. So don't worry if you didn't fully understand that code. In the next lecture, we're going to be coding and explaining it a lot more. So again, when we actually set up the models, we can migrate the database. And this basically lets Django do the heavy lifting of creating SQL databases that correspond to the models we created. And this is the part that's really cool about Django. You can just write up those classes. And then with a very simple command, Django is going to do all the heavy lifting of creating a SQL database that corresponds to that model. Django can do this entire process with just a simple command, python manage.py migrate, which we talked about earlier in the course when we got a warning from Django telling us to do this migrate call. But now, since we actually are going to work with models, we can do it. After that, we then register the changes to our app, shown here with some generic app one. So we would say python manage.py make migrations and then your application name, app one, first app, whatever you happen to call it. We then migrate the database one more time, python manage.py, migrate. And then later on, we can actually use the shell from the manage.py file to play around with the models. And we'll show you how to do that as well. So in order to use the more convenient admin interface with the models, however, we need to register them to our applications admin.py file. And we can do this with the following code. We say from django.contrib import admin, and then from app.models or whatever app happens to be named, you import the actual models, model one, model two. In those previous examples, that would be things like topic or web page, date accessed, etc. And then we say admin.site.register and you pass in the model as an argument. Then with the models in the database created, we can use Django's fantastic admin interface to interact with the database. And this is something that's really cool and awesome about Django. It's one of the key features. The fact that once you set up these databases, Django is going to do all the heavy lifting to create those models into, Django, into databases, and you're going to have a full admin interface. So we'll show you how to log in 
to the admin interface, and then you can read what's going on in the models. So in order to fully use the database and the admin, we're going to need to create a super user. And we can do this with the following command, python manage.py create super user. And then you're asked to provide a name, email, and password. So remember, when we actually are coding through this in the next lecture or the next couple of lectures, that you're going to have to remember or write down the name, email, and password you provide for this super user. Okay, then once we've set up the models, it's always a good idea to populate them with some test data. And we're going to be using a library to help with this called Faker, which produces fake data, and we'll create a script to do this as well. All right, I know I've been talking a lot and we've discussed a ton. Don't worry if you didn't actually understand how to implement all that stuff, but hopefully you did get a general idea of how the Django models, the databases, and the admin interface kind of connect with each other. In the next lecture, in the next few lectures, we're going to be coding through an example of all of this to really help your understanding. Okay, thanks everyone, and I'm excited to get to the next lecture because we're really going to see the power of Django coming up with the models. Thanks, and I'll see you there. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Creating Models lecture for Django Level 2. We covered a lot of concepts in the previous lecture, so let's actually start implementing them. And in order to do that, we are going to continue working with the two project folders from Django Level 1. If you don't have those, you can always download them from the course notes. Okay, let's start making some models. I'm going to hop over to the editor and open up the first project folder now. Okay, here I am at the editor, and I have my file structure, Django Level 1, and I have the two projects from Django Level 1, Pro 2 and First Project. So you can open those up, and what I want you to do is inside of first app, open up the models.py file. And you should have somewhere in that models.py file from django.db import models. And if you don't have that for some reason, go ahead and type that in. And now what we're going to do is using object-oriented programming, we'll create models with Django. So models, as we discussed in the previous lecture, are just classes. And then we give the actual name. You can kind of relate these to the name of the table inside the database. And then we'll actually inherit from models.model. So that's the base class. So we're going to have this topic be a derived class. And then this class object attribute, top underscore name, is going to be equal to models. Dot, and then we actually have to specify what kind of field it's going to be. This is going to be a character field for the actual topic. And then we'll say max length is equal to 264. So max length is a constraint of this character field. It's really up to you what value you choose for the maximum length. Obviously you should have some maximum length, otherwise your users are going to be able to put as many characters as they want and you'll have to save them. 264 for a topic name, it's probably overkill, but that's totally fine. Then we can say unique, which is a parameter to require as a constraint that all the topics be unique, meaning you can't have duplicates in there. So we'll say that's true as well. And then usually you'll also want to have some sort of string representation of your model. So if you ever have to print out an instance of topic, you will be able to do that without any error. So we know that there's a special method for that from the object-oriented programming sections, and that's just the str. And then we're going to say return self.topName. Now let's create two more models. We'll create a web page, models.model. And then we'll create three class object attributes here, the topic, and these are essentially the columns inside the table web page. And this will be a foreign key because we're going to grab from topic, which makes sense. And then we have name which is going to be models dot, and this will be a character field. And we'll give this as well a max length, set that equal to 264, 264, 128, that's totally fine, whatever you want. And I also want to specify the unique constraint here to be true. And then finally, I'm going to have URL be equal to models dot URL field. And I also want this to be unique. So you can always visit the documentation of Django for the actual available fields, but we're definitely going to be showing you the most common ones as we continue on through this course. Things like integer fields, date fields, etc. So just keep that in mind. 
And then we also want some sort of string representation here. Pass in self. And I'm going to say return self dot, and we'll return the name of the web page as its string representation. Finally, let's create an access record class. And this will also inherit from models.model. And what this access record class is going to be is we'll say the name of models dot foreign key. And then what we will do is pass in web page. And we're also going to have a date field. When was it actually accessed? So the date column will be models dot a date field. No extra constraints there. And then if I want a string representation of this, I'll say str self, and then I'm going to just pass the actual date. So I'll return self.date. But unfortunately, since this is a date time object, uh, it needs us to be casted as a string. And if you're ever unsure if one of these fields is going to be able to just simply be represented as a string, you can always just cast it using the str built-in function. Okay, so looks like all our models are ready. Now it's time to actually create the SQL databases behind these models. And this is what the real power of Django is, is all you have to do is define classes here and Django is going to take care of the rest of actually building out that SQL database for you. And we do that through a series of commands. The first one we need to do is to actually initiate this entire process. In that project folder, I will call python manage.py and then call migrate. Hit enter and you should see running migrations. And if you've already run this, if you run it twice, you'll see no migrations to apply. I accidentally already ran it before I filmed this. So it says no migrations. For you, it will say something else if you haven't run this already. Then the next thing you have to do is register the changes to your application. So what we will do here is say python manage.py and we call make migrations. Let me make sure I spelled that right. Yep, make migrations and then the name of your application. In our case, it's simple. It's just first app. We'll hit enter and you'll see some other things. Now I got no changes detected in app first app because I already ran this. Again, you'll get something else. It'll say something like creating model, creating model, etc. And after you've done that, you need to run Python make manage.py migrate one more time. So we'll say Python manage.py migrate one more time. And for me, it says no migrations to apply. You'll probably get something different since you'll be running it for the first time. So those three commands, this one, python manage.py, then python manage.py, make migrations, your application name, and then again, python manage.py, migrate. And now our models should be ready and connected to a SQL database that Django just created for us and register the changes to our application. And now the question arises, well, how do you actually confirm that all of this worked and how do you actually interact with that database? Well, we'll show you the most simple and basic way and that's to create some test data with some shell commands. So using Python at the shell, we can actually interact with our database. And this is how I'm going to do that. I will call python manage.py shell. And this will open up an interactive console for me. I'm using uh, Python 3.5 here. You're probably using Python 3.6. That's totally fine. Either one should work. And I'm going to collapse that tree so we can see a little more here. And whoops, it's not what I meant to do. Okay, let's come back down to the console. Here we go. Now, to make sure everything's working, I'm just going to print hello. I should get hello back. And good, Python's working fine. What we will do is we'll say from first underscore app dot models. So this is the models.py file I have open right here from that first app folder. Import topic. So actually import an instance or import that class so we can work with it. And that worked fine. If you get an error here, it's probably because you forgot to do the migration command. So keep that in mind. And then we can say print topic dot objects dot all close parentheses and if I run this this will actually print all the objects in that topic model or topic table you'll get nothing back the first time so let's create something we'll say t is equal to an instance of topic and we'll say the top name 
So the topic name is the social network. So maybe a couple websites fall on their social networks, things like Instagram, Facebook. Uh, I don't know if anyone's still on MySpace, but you get the idea. I'll hit enter here. And then to actually save this change, I say t.save. And that's a method that we inherit from the models.model class. So I hit enter. Now it's saved. So if I run that previous command of print topic.objects.all, I get back query set topic social network. Great. So I actually was able to affect all of this. And now I'm going to quit. So, so far we've created models and we've created the databases behind them and we actually use shell commands to add something. Now we're definitely not going to be using the shell every time we want to add something or view our model or get an idea of what the database actually contains. In order to use more convenience, we use the admin interface. And this is, again, a really awesome feature of Django. It's going to have a fully developed admin interface with very little work from us. But in order to have the admin interface with the models, we need to register them to our application's admin.py file. So let's show you how we can do that. I'm going to open up the directory tree here. And I have my application folder. And inside of that, I see admin.py. And it looks something like this from django.contrib import admin and it says register your models here. So I need to basically tell my application uh, that my models exist. So I'll say from and then you put in the name of your application. So in my case it's first app dot models so that models.py file import and then I'm going to import all the models. So that's access record that's topic and Adam should be helping you out here. And then the last one was called uh, web page I believe. There we go. And then it's time to register them. And the way you register them is from that admin dot site dot register. And it should be lowercase. And then we pass in the actual model. So we can start with access record. And then we'll do this a couple more times for the other two models. We'll say register topic and then admin dot site dot register register and then finally web page. Okay, so these are registered and ready to be used with the admin interface. In order to actually fully use the database with the admin interface, I need to create a super user. That way not just any Joe Schmo can come in and start messing around with our database. Only people who were creating the website and had access to all of this information could create a super user. And we can do that with the following. So under first project, I'm going to say Python manage.py. And then we say create super user. And then later from the admin interface, you can create more super users or give people more permissions. But we have to create at least one super user here from this command line. So we'll create a super user. And we need to have a username, a password, and an email address. Now it's totally up to you what you want to provide here as your username, email, and password. Just really make sure that you remember them or write them down somewhere. Otherwise you'll have to repeat uh, this entire create super user process. So I'm going to say my username is Jose, email address, let's say training at pyreandata.com. And then my password, I'll just say T-E-S-T-P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D, test password. It won't let you do super weak passwords, so keep that in mind. Uh, this one that I'm typing in is really weak, just test password, but I don't really care since I'm never actually going to launch this website. All right, so I created a super user. Now it's time to actually use that super user with the admin interface. And let's do that by actually running the server and checking out that admin interface in our browser. So I'll say Python manage.py run server hit enter and hopefully we have no errors. Okay, I'm going to copy and paste this and jump to my browser. Okay, so here I am at my browser. If you did everything correctly, you shouldn't notice anything on the front end change. You still get this picture of Django himself. But if you say slash admin and hit enter, now you get a login where you can provide your username and then your password. So let's provide our password. In my case, it was really weak. Test password, hit login. 
And now this is what the Django admin page looks like. And this was all done automatically for you by Django. The SQL databases were created for you. This admin page was created for you with just those few lines of code. And I know right now it may seem like you had to do a lot of work to get all of this, but once you feel really comfortable with Django, this is going to feel like magic every time. It still amazes me every time that Django does this all for you automatically. So this is really, really awesome. Okay, so if we check out topics, I can actually click on topics here. And I see that I have my topic social network. And then I can click on that. I can delete it. I can save, add another, uh, save and continue editing, go to history of this, um, come back to first app, topics, or uh, whoops, uh, come see something else, access records. Right now I have zero access records. I can manually add in an access record. So that's pretty cool as well. So let's say I go to web pages and instead of using shell commands, I could click here, add a web page. I select the topic. I can either click plus here to add another topic or select from existing topics. Remember, this is a foreign key into another table, so it's a drop down menu. Social network, and then we can give it a name. So this web page can be something like Google, and the URL will be something like www.google.com. And then we're just going to say save. And now I have a web page. Great. And now you can see how we can use Django admin to create and access uh, records. Now you also see just how powerful the admin interface and why only certain people should have authentication and authorization to access this page. If someone else uh, maliciously access this page, they can do a lot of damage to your website. So again, this is super important that you protect access to this admin page. This essentially gives you control over the entire site. And later on in the course, we'll discuss users, groups, permissions, a lot more. But we can see here there's already an authentication authorization application for us. Um, you can check out users. Right now we only have Jose, that's me, uh, but maybe you're working with other people in your company and you want to add permissions. Um, you can eventually add users from here. So you can say add a user, their username, password, password confirmation, etc. So again, Django admin interface, a lot of power here. You got to keep this safe. Okay, so that's it for now. Uh, coming up next, we're going to continue talking about Django models and a lot more. And we'll also show you how to actually use the library Faker to populate your databases. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next slide. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Populating Models Lecture. It's usually a good idea to create some sort of script that will populate your models with some dummy data, that is, fake data. Let's show you how you can use the Faker library to create this sort of script. I'm going to hop over to the editor now. Okay, so here I'm open at the editor, and the first thing we need to do is to actually install the Faker library. And you can do that with a simple pip install, and make sure you're in the correct virtual environment uh, before you do this, but you'll say pip install, and then with a capital F, A-K-E-R, hit enter, and this should pip install the Faker Python library for you. And it's a pretty quick download, so it shouldn't take that much time. All right, looks like it's finished installing for me. So that's all we need to do for that. Okay, let me quickly show you what the documentation for Faker looks like. You can just come to faker.readthedocs.io and then check out the master link here. But it just shows you the basic usage of Faker. I can kind of zoom in here. Basically what you end up doing is after you pip install Faker, you say from Faker import factory or from Faker import Faker. That's the way we're gonna do it. And then you just say, fake is an instance of faker class, and you can call different methods off of it. Create a fake name, create a fake address, create some fake text, etc. And they have tons of methods here, so you can check out the documentation for all the various methods. If you click down here on uh, providers, it shows you things like fake credit card, fake date time, fake internet address, person, Python files, etc. So let's show you how you can use this uh, library, faker, to actually create some fake data to populate our models with. So inside of my top level first project folder, I'm going to right click and create a new file. And it's kind of up to you where you want to save the population script. I usually save it on the top level uh, file. So again, it's up to you, but we'll call it populate underscore first underscore app dot pi. And we'll have it open here. Let's minimize some of this stuff so we get a little more room to read this. And then I'm going to say import OS and then I'm going to need to configure the settings for the project and I actually need to run this before I call any code. 
So I need to say os.environ for the environment, and I'm going to set the default, and then I'm going to pass in, in all caps, Django settings underscore module, and then set it equal to, or pass in as a second parameter, first underscore project dot settings. And basically what this is doing is just configuring the settings for the project. And you need to do this before you start manipulating the actual models. Then from here, we can import Django and then set it up. So I can say Django.setup and this should set up and configure the project settings. From here on, next is our fake pop script or fake population script. So I'm gonna import a couple things. I'll import random and then I will also say from, excuse me, from first app dot models import, we'll do access record, web page, and topic. And then finally, the library we just downloaded, we'll say from faker import with a capital F faker. The naming convention isn't so great there, but that's the way they decided to do it. Then we create an instance of that faker object. I'll call it fake gen for fake generation. And then we'll call faker, close parentheses. And then I'm going to just make a list of topics. So remember the topics, that was a very simple model. So I'll just create those manually. I'll have one topic of websites be search, one topic of websites be social, another one be a marketplace type site, and then finally we'll have news and games. So various topics for different websites. Then we'll create a function that can actually add topics. So we'll say add topic, and this is going to look really similar to using those shell commands. I'll say t is equal to topic dot objects dot, and in this case, I'm going to call the get underscore or create. And what this does, it's, it's either going to retrieve the topic if it already exists in the model or create it. And I'm going to pass in top name is equal to, and I'll say random choice. So the random choice method from the topics list. And then I grab here a zero because of the way this is formatted back. And to discuss this sort of formatting from get or create a little more is the general format, it's essentially a tuple that returns object and then something that's created. And the first element in the tuple object is a reference to the model instance that this get or create method creates if the database entry wasn't found. And then the entry is created using the parameters that you pass here. And in this case, I'm just saying, uh, pick one of these topics as a random choice. And you can check out the official Django documentation if you want more information about this get or create method. But the basic idea here, it's going to return a tuple and I just wanna grab the first object in that tuple, which is that reference to the model instance. So that's why I have to add an additional index of zero here. Then once I've done that, I'm going to say t.save as we've done before, and I will then return t. So that's my simple add topic. Now let's show you kind of the more complicated ways for populating access record and web page, which weren't just a simple one word. So I will say def, and we'll just call this populate and we'll have it a default end to populate with. So the user can then later change that or provide it. We could also make it some sort of command line uh, parameter you can pass in. Right now we'll keep it as, let's say n equals five. And what we're going to do is say for entry in range n, first we need to do is get the topic for the entry. So we'll say top is equal to add topic. And then I want to create the fake data for that entry. So I create a fake URL object. So I call fake gen, which is that instance of faker. And the method for a URL is just dot URL. Then I need to create some 
fake dates for that. And that's just, again, fake gen, and we call date off of that, the date method. And then I need to get a fake name for this website, like a fake company name. So I can call fake gen dot and then call company off of this. There are a ton of uh, different more or a lot more methods you can call off of this, like fake first name, fake last name, fake credit card, etc. Again, you can explore the documentation if you're interested in those. Right now, that's really all we need. So then I'll create the new web page entry. And I'll create a variable WEBPG for short for web page. And that will be web page dot objects. And then I'm going to use that getter create again. And then I will specify that for this web page, the topic is equal to top. The URL is equal to that fake URL I generated. And the name of it is equal to that fake name I generated. And again, I need to grab just the first object in that tuple that's returned. So we'll keep that. And then I want to create a fake access record for that web page. So I will say ACC underscore REC is equal to access record. Again, objects, get or create, and I'll supply that the name was the web page. And then date is equal to fake underscore date. And again, I just want that first object. So note, this is going to be a little different on this first parameter. Because if you remember back to what the actual models look like, if I click here, for web page, the topic was the foreign key topic. So when I'm actually generating that fake data, notice that instead of passing just um, some fake topic name, I'm actually grabbing a topic object. So if we go back here, I'm returning T from add topic. So I'm actually returning a topic object, which is why I'm passing it here when I'm saying get or create. And it's the same thing for access records. If we come back here for access record, it's foreign key for the name is web page. So it actually belongs here to web page, which means I'm going to pass in the entire web page here. So that web page that I just created, I'm passing it in to the access record because it was a foreign key. So keep that in mind. You can't just pass in a string here if you have it as a foreign key in the models. Okay, next, finally, at the end of all this thing, I'm going to say if main, name is equal to main here. I'm going to print some command like populating scripts. And then we can say populate. And here you can actually pass in whatever number you want. Remember the default was five. We could change it to be 20 if we wanted to. That should be no problem. And then once that's done, we'll say something like population, or we'll say populating complete. Save that, and now it's time to actually test to see if we uh, got this all right. So I'll come back up here, and then I'm going to clear my console, and let's make sure I'm in the right place. So I should be under first project, and I will call Python, whoops, we'll call, make sure I'm right, Python, populate underscore first underscore app dot pi. Hit enter, it's populating the script. You see kind of a bunch of stuff here happening with uh, DB SQLite. The, the higher end value you, you provide, the more time it will take to generate all that fake data. So keep that in mind. It looks like it all worked. So now let's actually test it. Let's run our website. I will say now Python manage.py run server. It's going to run the server and let me grab this URL and put it in my browser and bring that browser open. So here's the browser, and then let's say slash admin. And if we take a look at this, let's check out the web pages we have. And now here I can see I have a bunch of fake web pages that I just generated and populated. Pretty cool. Come back to access records. Here I have a bunch of fake access records, and you could have limited the access record dates. It doesn't really matter for our use case, but we see that we're able to click on one, check it out, has a name, we could also reassign the name. 
But now you have a better idea of what a fuller database actually looks like. So here are web pages again. Here are the topics. Remember the topics were just a few topics, but I could click then social, change it, etc. Okay, that's all we need to know now for uh, population scripts. Hopefully you'll find them useful when you're working with your own websites. We won't touch on them uh, too often in the future, but keep in mind that we can use them and that Faker library is hopefully really useful to you. Thanks, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Models, Templates, Views lecture for Django. Django operates on what is known as a Models, Templates, and Views paradigm. It's also called MTV for short, and it encompasses the idea of how to connect everything we've talked about so far. So we've talked about models and databases, we showed a little bit of templates and their tagging, and we've talked about views as well. But how do we actually connect everything? There are a few basic steps to achieving the goal of serving dynamic content to a user based off the connection of those models, views, and templates. Let's walk through these steps. The first step is that in that views.py file, we import any models that we will need to use. The second step is to use the view to query the model for data that we will need. The third step is to pass results from the model to the template. The fourth step is to edit the template so that it's ready to accept and display the data from the model. And then the fifth step is to map a URL to that actual view. We can practice this methodology by changing what we display on the front index page. So to begin our understanding of this entire process, we're going to start by actually generating a table on that index page. The table will display all the web pages and access records from the access record database we created and populated. We'll also be using template tagging to connect the model to that HTML page. This entire process is going to be introducing a lot of new things, so don't be intimidated. The template tagging especially can seem confusing at first. We've already seen a little bit of it with the static images that we use template tagging to inject into the HTML. But again, don't worry if the template tagging seems confusing. We're going to be getting tons of practice with this later on as we develop more clones of websites. After we walk through all of this with some code, you will have a challenge to practice your own MTV skills on your own. Level three is going to focus a lot more on expanding this idea of MTV and the mapping URL step. That's step number five, which we haven't really dived into yet, and we won't focus too much on this particular section of the course. Okay. Let's get started. I'm going to open up my editor and walk through this entire MTV paradigm. Okay, let's get started showing an example of how to actually use MTV uh, paradigm. So I'm going to come over here to first project, first app, and open up my views.py file. And so far I had this uh, simple index request that took this dictionary and then used that to actually inject with template tagging the actual content into HTML. We're going to be expanding on this idea by connecting this to the database. So I'm going to say from first app dot models import and then the three models. We had topic, we had web page, and we had access record. And then here in this actual index, and I would change this uh, if I wanted to do a different view, but right now we'll keep things simple, everything on the home page. I'm going to make a variable called web pages list. And this is going to be equal to access record. And then I'm going to call the objects. And then I'm going to call the objects and say order by, which is a method off of these objects. And then order by the date field. So if you're a little confused by that order by, it's a really common SQL command. So you can, if you're used to SQL, that probably feels really natural. But it basically just says order this by that date field or that date column. Then I'm going to create a date dictionary. So we'll say date underscore DICT is equal to, and then I'm going to call the key access record. I'll say access records. And then that web pages list is going to be the actual value for that. So let's get rid of this dictionary. And then finally I'm going to return render first app slash index.html and then for the context, it's going to be instead of that my dictionary, it will be that date dictionary, date underscore the ICT. Okay, so the main things to get across here is that we were in views.py and that first step, remember, is we had to actually import the models. And then here, I'm going to use render to actually grab stuff from the model itself and then use template tagging later on to inject it into the HTML. 
So, so far we're done with steps one and two, where we imported the models and used the view to query the model for the data we need. Now I'm going to come over to my actual HTML, and that's over here under templates, first app, index.html. And I'm going to, I'm going to essentially clear all of this. This is now going to be the original index.html. So if you open up the Django level two files, you'll notice that there's two HTMLs original index and then index. Uh, right now I'm going to go with the index. The original index is just everything I deleted. All right, so I said HTML, and then if we're ever dealing with static files, we'll want to load them. We may or may not have them this time, but it's always a good idea to say load static files in case you're gonna have them. And then we'll keep the title, we'll say title is Django level two. And also in the head, let's give the link to the CSS file so we can get used to doing that. So I'll type in link. It's a style sheet. href is going to be an injection here with template tagging. So I'll say static. And then here in quotes, and actually this whole thing needs to be in quotes. So let's make sure that's correct. And I'm going to say with a closing tag here, static, and then with another set of quotes, CSS, and then whatever it happened to be. I believe it was my style. And we can add that in, that CSS. So we'll save this. And if I expand my static folder, I should see CSS, and there's my style.css. It only changes heading to color red, but we can work fit later on. Okay. So, so far I've loaded the static files and I was able to do that to link to my actual CSS file. But what we really want to focus on here is using the template tagging to grab from the view the requested information from the models. So inside the body I'll say h1, hi, we'll say hi, welcome to Django level two. And then h2 will say, here are your access records. Probably won't want to do something like this realistically on a website where you just display all the information from your model, but for right now we're keeping things simple. And I'm going to make a div here, and this class is going to just be jang2. That way I can grab it later on. Okay, and this is where it's going to look a little strange with the template tagging. I'm going to say here with the curly brackets and then the percent sign if access underscore records. So what does that actually mean? Here I'm just checking if I actually have the access records from, if I go back to views.py, uh, right here. So if I actually have this key, then do some stuff. So you can see it's it's a little bit like Python. It's not quite full Python as far as the syntax, but it's, it's similar. And then I'm going to create a table tag, and then we'll create t head, and then I'll say site name, and then here I will say they accessed. Okay, so those are the basics here. And now what I need to do is actually insert the table rows. And the table rows are going to be connected to the actual model. So I need to somehow add in logic here that loops through every uh, row in the access records. And what that looks like is this, I say for some temporary variable name, we'll say ACC in, and then access records. And this has to match in whatever you had over here in views for the key. So what I'm saying is for this temporary variable in access records, and remember access records is going to be this list of web pages that's ordered by the date from the model. Hopefully here you can begin to see kind of that peak of the iceberg of that MTV, how we're connecting all the moving pieces. And then what I do is I create the table row tag, tr, and I'll create table cell tag, td, and inside of this, now I use the sets of curly brackets with no percent sign, because it's not actually logic, it's essentially just injecting text right now. And we'll say acc dot, and then we actually call what we want. So I'll say dot name for the site name, and then again, I'll call acc, 
and then the actual field I want. In this case, the field is date, because that's how I have it here, site name and then date accessed. And then finally, you have to make sure that whenever you have this for tag, that for loop tag, you end it. So here, I'm going to make sure that we end that by saying end for. Now that's a little different than anything we've seen in Python, so keep that in mind. And I actually want this whole thing to be inside that closing table tag. So I will save that. And then since I have this if access records, I need an else to go along with it. So let's add that in. And that's going to be outside of the table. We'll say else. We'll print out a paragraph. No access records found. And then since I have that if and that else, I need to end it. So we say end if. And then that's the end of the div tag. And that's really all we need here. So I will save that. And then let's check out the urls.py file, make sure that's all linked up. So in their first project, they have urls.py. Make sure that's OK. And that all still looks good. It looks like I'm connecting views.index to the home page. So that makes sense. And if I look at my urls.py file in first app, that also makes sense here. Great. So let's see if this actually worked and try it out. I'm going to say python manage.py run server, hit enter, see if we get any errors here. Okay, no errors. That's a good sign. I'm going to copy and paste this into my browser. Let's bring it over. So bringing it over gets us this. It says, hi, welcome to Django level two. Here are your access records. And embarrassingly, I spelled your wrong, but hopefully you forgive me. And here I can see that I have the actual table. So let's give a little bit of styling to this table so it's a little bit more readable. And I can do that simply by affecting the CSS. So if I come over here to static, remember I'm loading this actual static. So let's change it up so we get a little bit of color on those table cells. So I will say here table, and then we'll give it a border, uh, let's say two pixels, solid black. And if I want to actually give border not just to the outside of the table, but to the table header and table rows, I can put a comma here, th, comma, td. Or since I actually gave it a class, if I remember correctly, coming up here. So it is Django2. So let's actually grab this Django2 class and then add it in. So I'll say dot Django2. Let's see if that actually works. Come back here, bring back my actual HTML, or excuse me, refresh the page. And we're getting not found static. Let's come back here to index.html, make sure that was all correct. And I'm missing the percent sign to close this, so that should have matched. Okay, now let's save this. Run this again. Control C, Python manage.py run server. Bring back my actual browser. And if I bring it back here, now I see that the heading is also connected, so I probably should have noticed that last time. And I can see here that I have the table with the border. So it looks like I need to actually add in some more. So let's just make it table THTD, save that. We'll refresh the page and restart this. And refreshing that page, now I get these nice double borders. Okay, so hopefully you can begin to see how you've connected everything. Okay, now I wanted to take a little bit of time to discuss how Django can help you debug your code, especially with template tagging, if you ever feel confused on it. So. As you probably just noticed, like even I can confuse the template tagging or actually accidentally make mistakes. Uh, the error reporting is actually really good for this sort of thing. So if you come down, you know, you're doing your template tagging and you forgot to write end if. So your, your code is really long. You had the if statement up here. And, you know, typically in Python, you don't have to say end if. So you just accidentally forget. Well, if you take a look at what the refresh site looks like after you say end if, I refresh it. And here we already see that I have a temp template syntax error. And bringing the page over looks something like this. It says unclosed tag if, looking for one of end if. It actually reports back that it's looking for an end if. And if you scroll down, it will actually tell you what it's looking for as far as its match. So it says, hey, this highlighted line, if access records, 
has no matching and if. And you can see there's an entire trace back here that you can follow as well. So the error reporting is actually really good on the website. So definitely take advantage of that. It will essentially almost always tell you directly what it's looking for. Now, if you don't actually know what this means, then you can always Google search it or search Stack Overflow and you'll probably find your answer there. Okay, hopefully now you have a better understanding of how to use the MTV paradigm to actually connect your models and inject content into the HTML. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to Django Level 2 Project Exercise. We've learned a lot about setting up models, templates, and views, and it's time for you to get some practice. We're going to be using the same Pro 2 project from Django Level 1, so if you don't have that, you can download it from the Django Level 1 folder notes. Or if you want, you can also start from a fresh project. It's up to you. Here's what you have to do starting from a project with an application. I want you to add a new model called a user, and this model should have these fields. A first name field for the user, a last name character field for the user, and then an email field. And make sure to make the migrations as we showed earlier in this section of the course, and then create a script that will populate your database with fake users. Then confirm that the populating worked through the admin interface. Once you've done that, then create a view for your website for the domain extension slash users. This slash users page will be an HTML list of the usernames and emails, which means if someone goes to your main web page, that index page, they'll just see some heading, whatever you want to show. But when they go to the extension slash users, they'll actually see an HTML list of the usernames and emails. And then you're going to be using template tags to actually generate this content from the user model. And remember to change your urls.py file to actually deal with the changes to the user's extension, both in your actual application and in your project. Let's get a quick look at what the final page should actually look like. All right, so upon launching your website, you should see something like this on the home index page. It says, welcome, go to users to see the list of user information. So then when you start typing slash users, hit enter, you should see a generated list where you have numbers saying user info, and then inside there's a nested list with the first name, the last name, and then the email. And all these first names, last names, and emails have been randomly generated with the uh, Faker library, so they may not match the first name or last name, that's totally okay. It's basically just totally fake data. All right, so this is what it should look like, and remember, we are dynamically generating this content from the actual models. If you have any questions, feel free to post the Q&A forums, but other than that, best of luck, and in the next lecture, we'll be coding out through an example solution. I'll see you there. Hello everyone, and welcome to Django Level 2 Project Exercise Solutions Lecture. In this lecture, we'll be coding through the Project Exercise Solutions and showing you how to do it from scratch, meaning we'll actually start a project and create an application from the very beginning. And the reason for this is that you can later on use this lecture as a reference for everything we've covered, not just in Django Level 2, but Django Level 1 as well. Okay, let's hop over to the editor and get started. Okay, so here I am at my editor, and to get started, I'm going to actually activate my virtual environment. If you want to know what your virtual environments are, you can go to conda info dash dash envs, and this is totally optional. As I mentioned back when we were discussing virtual environments, you don't need to use a virtual environment. It's definitely a good idea, especially if you plan to actually use this uh, the website or application and host it somewhere online, then you definitely want to use a virtual environment. But if you plan on just playing with things locally, it's not a big deal to not use one. All right, so then I see my Django ENV, that's the one I want. So I will say activate my Django ENV. And this is the environment that's using Python 3 and also has Django installed. And then what I'm going to do is actually under Django Lectures, the folder I'm in, I have a folder called Django Level 2. So I will cd to Django Level 2, and I'm just using tab to autocomplete there. And then I'm going to create my project. And remember, we can create a project with the Django admin command line tool. And that basically allows us to just say Django-admin and then call the start project command, and then whatever you want to name the project. I'll try to keep the name similar to what the actual Django level one secondary project was. It was Pro 2, so we'll keep that. Hit enter, and then it may take a couple of seconds for it to actually create the project files, but it's going to create those files. Here they are. And then we have Pro 2, Pro 2, settings, URLs, and then manage.py. 
So now let's actually create an application. And we do that with the python manage.py commands. So I will cd into pro2 so I can get access to that actual manage.py file. Now that I'm in the same directory as it, I will call python manage.py and then I'm going to call the command start app and then the name of my application. In this case, we'll just call it something simple like app2, but again, you can call it whatever you want. And you'll probably want to choose better names than what I'm choosing here since I'm doing very generic names so we can kind of tell each single step. And now I have my project, my application, and everything's ready to go. As I continue along, I'm going to need to add something to the settings.py file to let it know where my application is. But I also want to add a templates folder, and we can also later on add a static folder. I'm going to just do this manually. So the way I can do this is right click on the Pro 2 and say new folder, and I will call this one templates. And then inside of templates, I'm going to create another folder called app2. And then here I'm going to have any templates that relate to application2. And for the case of our project exercise, it's going to be two templates, the index.html page, that's the home page, and then the actual users page. So I'll create a new file and we'll call that users.html. Okay, and we'll deal with actually uh, editing these much later. So I can close them for now. Just make sure they're actually created. And then I want to go to settings.py file. And my next step is to actually make sure that it knows where the templates are. So create that template directory and add it. And also add the, the application two that I made to the settings.py file. So let's walk through that again. For the template directory, I just say template underscore dir. And we do a very similar process when you have the static directory. Here I'm going to say os.path, join. Remember we want to use relative path names. And then I'm going to call the base directory and then add on to it templates. So all I'm saying is, okay, go to the base directory and then a subdirectory of that is this templates folder I just made. So I can save that and then I'm going to scroll down here to that templates list with a dictionary inside of it. Here it is. And here under directories, I want to let it know that the variable template underscore dir is what I'm referencing. So we'll save that. And I always add in a comma just in case. And then scrolling back up, we can see we have installed apps listed. And I want to make sure that it also knows the application I just made is there. So I will say app two. And we can save that. All right, settings.py should now be good to go. So let's continue. The first thing I like to do is start off with the actual models. So I will come to app two, open up the models and create them here. So I'll create a user class and we always inherit from models.model. And then we do the class object attributes, which are the fields. So we have a first name field and that's going to be models dot, and we'll have that be a character field. And we'll give this a max length constraint of 128. Again, up to you, whatever you want the constraints to be. Last name is also going to be essentially the exact same thing. Max length, we'll set that equal to 128. And then finally, we have the email field. And hopefully you were able to figure out that email field is available to you. And we'll give this a maximum length of a little longer, let's just say 264. And I also want all the emails to be unique. And the logic behind that is sometimes people share the same first and last name if it's a really common. So for something like John Smith um, can be a really common first and last name. We wanna make sure that at least their emails are unique. Otherwise we may have a duplicate in the user base. Okay, so we can save that and we have our models done. Up next, I wanna make sure that I actually have the views for this. So I'll come to app2, views.py, and at first we're using HTTP response, but now we can just use the render function. And remember, I need to actually say from app2.models and import my model. That way I can use it. So now it's time to create a view. Right now we've only known about function views. Later on we'll learn about class-based views. So we have def index that takes a request is going to be the home page. And I'm just going to return render 
take in the request, and then find under templates app2 slash index.html. And we will save that. Then the next thing I want to do is actually create the view for that users page. So that's going to be DEF users. That takes in a request. And we're going to have a user list object, which is just going to call the user, grab all those objects, and then we can also call order by on them and order by the first name. You could also just grab all of them, but it's always nice to order them somehow especially given what we're going to be doing. And we'll talk a lot more about uh, this actual sort of commands of grabbing objects, or excuse me, models for your views. Right now we'll keep things simple. And then finally we want to create that context dictionary. And here we'll keep it to say users is the key. And then the actual value is user list. Then I'm going to return. And I'll return the render command or render function and here that's going to be app2 users.html and then I also want to, oh, first argument should be request almost forgot, okay request, now it's app2 users.html and then for the context I'll set it equal to that dictionary we just created user underscore the ICT. Save that and now we have our views created. So we have the home page view and the actual users view. So the user view right now is going to grab all the objects from user, order them by their first name, and it sets up that dictionary users for this user list. So we can actually return that and then grab stuff from it. So we're ready to go on this front. Up next what we have to do is actually set up the URL files. So let's actually underneath our app2 create the urls.py file we'll be using. So we'll create a new file under app2 urls.py Remember we have URLs for the actual application and then URLs across the entire project. So this is what it looks like across the entire project and then this is what it looks like in the application. So right now the application URLs is going to be quite simple. We'll just say from Django.config.urls import URL and then from app2 import those views. Then we'll create a URL patterns list. And here we will just call the URL function. And then using regular expressions, we'll say caret and then the dollar sign. And we will call views.users. And we will assign it the name users. That way we can call it later. And I've been using the word users a lot, so maybe in your own applications you won't want to have so many names doubled up. Uh, but for something this simple, we have users.html directly related to the users view here, and then I'm naming this users. Um, that's okay for now, since it's pretty simple and straightforward. Not a whole lot of applications or views, but later on you may want to hone in on unique names. So if you come back to this later, it makes more sense to you. Okay, so now it's actually time to edit the URLs in the project. And again, remember there's kind of three distinct ways to do this. Right now we haven't learned about class-based view yet, but we know about function views. So the way to do that, we'll show you the simplest way, is you just say from app2 import views. And then what we can do here, for instance, for the home page is say URL. And since that's going to be the home page, we'll just say caret dollar sign and then call views.index and then we say the name index here, comma. And then the other way is using this include function that we haven't imported in, so let's actually do that first. So we can import include as another way to do this and we'll do that for the users. So we'll say URL and then we'll say regular expression here, caret users slash, so now anything slash users comes here, and then I call include, and then pass in app2.urls. Save that, and then we should be good to go. Okay, let's check to see if we actually got everything working correctly by migrating the models to actual databases. So here we're going to call, whoops, Python, 
manage.py and then call migrate. We'll hit enter. And here we can see the migration happening, so that looks good. And then we need to register those changes to our application. So we'll say python manage.py make migrations and then the actual application name. In our case, it's app2. So we'll run that as well. And it looks like it created the model user. And then finally, we need to uh, rerun those migrations. So we'll say manage python manage.py migrate one more time. Hit enter. It's applying those changes and we're, we should be good to go. Now, if we actually want to use the admin interface with this model, we need to tell the admin that it's there. So I'm going to go to my admin.py file. Right now there's nothing there. But what I'm going to say is from my app, so in this case it's app2.models, import, and then I'm going to import, in this case the only model I have, user, and then say admin.site, register, and I will register that model with the admin interface. Okay, so we should have everything ready to go. Let's make sure, and we'll actually try running the server here. So we'll say python manage.py run server hit enter and let's see if we actually get everything working. Okay, so I'm going to copy and paste this, put it in my browser and bring it over. If you just ran that, you should have a blank page, so that's actually pretty good. Um, let's make sure that it's working by calling admin off of this. And here we have admin, so that's also working, but we haven't actually created a super user for the admin, so let's do that now. But it looks like the basics is working. We can do control C to kill that. Let's create a super user and actually put something in the index page. So we'll do that first. I'll type HTML on this index page and then give a heading one. Just say working, that way it's not totally blank and I know something's there that everything's actually connecting and then let's add in that super user. And then remember again, we do this with the manage.py file. Like I said, we're calling manage.py file a lot whenever we're working with Django. And then I'm going to create super user. Should ask me for my username. We'll say Jose is my username. Anything you want for the email address is fine. Just make sure you remember these. Otherwise you have to create another super user. And then finally, I'm going to put a weak password in. Test password, test password. Okay, super user created successfully. Looks like everything's good. Okay, now that I've created the super user of the admin, let's actually make sure everything has been registered. So let's call python manage.py migrate, hit enter. No migrations to apply, so that's good. All right, now that we've created the super user and checked those migrations again, we should be able to run the server. So let's call python manage.py run server run it and then bring in my browser with this. So I'm going to bring that in. Looks like it's working. So we'll go to slash admin, hit enter, enter your username and whatever your password was. Log in and here I see under app2, if I expand this a little bit, I have users. So I could come here to users. I have zero users. Um, zero, user is kind of a poor choice here because it's already under authentication and authorization. Now, the site admin page does separate it out by application, so you don't have to worry about mixing your um, users that use your website versus these users in this application. But again, keep in mind, probably call them something else. If I want to add a user, I can click add here. I'll give them the first name. So we'll say John Smith as a last name, and then an email I can say jsmith at yahoo.com or whatever and then let's just save this person and now we have one user object there. Great. So now what I'm going to do is zoom out a little bit. I'm going to log out. Thanks for spending some quality time with the website today and let's close this and then do control C to shut down that server. Looks like everything is working so far. Let's actually populate the database now. So what I'm going to do is under Pro2, I'll create a population script. I'm going to create a new file and we will call it populates underscore users.py. 
And there's a couple things we need to do first. First, I need to import OS here. And then I need to configure the settings for this project. So I need to say os.environ for environment, set default. And then I need to actually set the default Django settings module. So that's going to be Django settings module and then point it to wherever my project settings file is. In this case, it's just pro2 settings.py. So here I just say pro2.settings. Okay, once that's set up as a default, so again, that's configuring the settings for the project, I can just import Django itself and then call Django.setup. And that's what's going to allow us to actually go in and populate the database. Next, I'm going to import, actually, I don't believe we'll be needing random, so that's fine. We'll say from app2.models, import the user model, that class. And then I'm also going to say from faker, import faker. I'll create a fake gen object equal to faker. And then let's begin this. I will start off by creating a function called def populate. Has some n value, takes in. Let's put the default as five. And we'll say for entry in range n. Let's kind of minimize this a little bit so we have a little more space to code. And I'm going to collapse the directory just for now. Create a couple more lines here. So again, for entry in range n, I'm going to create the fake data. So I'll start off by creating a fake name, which we can just say off of fake gen dot name. And then I'm going to split that name. So it's a string of words and I want to split it on the white space. And that way the first thing I get out, which is the fake first name is equal to fake name zero, and then similarly, we can say fake last name is equal to fake name one. Then finally, let's create a fake email for this user. That's going to be fake gen email. Now we create a new entry in our actual database. I'll create user, call user, dot objects, dot get underscore or create. And here I just pass in the first name is equal to that fake first name I just made. Fake first name, there it is. And then, whoops, the last name is going to be equal to the fake last name I just made. And then finally, the email, let's actually put this on some newer lines. The email is going to be equal to that fake email that I just made. And then remember, this returns an object, so I need to grab from zero in order to do that kind of tuple unpacking. And at the end of all this, we'll just say if, almost had it, if name is equal to main, I'm going to print populating data bases, and let's actually run populate. We can leave it with, let's say, let's just pass in 20, so we get some values there, and then we'll print complete. Save that, and let's hope we didn't make any mistakes here, and actually run this. So we'll say Python, and then we're going to say populate users.py. We'll hit enter, let's see if this runs. It's populating databases and it's complete. Great, so now let's actually run that server again and make sure it's all working. Call Python, manage.py, run server, hit enter, bring in my browser. And then in my browser, we'll go to the admin site. So we'll say slash admin, Log in, go to users, and here I can see I have a bunch of user objects. Perfect. 
So I didn't actually uh, give any names to these user objects, but we see we have a first name, last name, and email. That's all we need, so we're going to log out. Close this. And finally, we have to do the template tagging to actually get those lists. So I'm going to do Control-C here, and then come to index.html. Working is fine. Let's just say h2 go to slash users to see the user list. Save that, and then their users.html. This is where we're going to be using the template tagging. All right, so let's get started. I'm going to say users is the title of this. And I know you're probably sick of even seeing the word user, so feel free to change it to whatever you want. And I'll create a heading saying, here are your users of this application. We'll say for app two. And then now it's time for the template tags. And again, don't let this uh, confuse you or intimidate you. First, we need to check if users and that's going to check if there's even a user's key in that dictionary. So if I come back to views here, it's going to check, hey, does this user dictionary that I'm passing in this context, if it has this key, then actually do something. So now coming back to users.html, if users, and it's always nice to, whenever you say an if right away, write its end if, so you make sure not to forget that. And this is all going inside the body. Let me collapse this a little bit. So we're saying if users, we have its end if already. And then what we're going to do is if that exists, we'll have an OL here and we'll say, we'll create a for loop that says for person in users, create a list and say user info. And then inside of this list will be an unordered list. So we have a nested list and then we have the list items. So it'll be a first name. And then here we're using template tagging to call person dot and then the actual field we want. In this case, we want the first name field. And then we'll call last name. And remember, I'm just using this template tagging of double sets of curly brackets because it's essentially just injecting text. So we'll say last name. It's not actually any sort of logic. Then finally, we'll say email. And we'll say person dot email. Save that. And remember, I have a four. So what I need to do is end this four and choose the appropriate location, which is going to be after all these list commands for these unordered list. So let's try that out. We'll say end four. Save that. And now let's run our server again and make sure that page actually is working. Paste Python, manage.py, run server, hit enter, bring in that page. And it looks like this is working, so let's actually try to go to users now. See if that's connected. And here they are. Here are users for your app. We have Brittany Daniels, etc., Cheryl, all these emails dynamically generated based off the model. And that's what you had to do for project two. And hopefully this served as a great review of everything we've done so far in the Django section of this course. We learned how to create a project, create the application, link the URLs, create the models, create the views, do the template tagging and make everything work together. And so far, this is everything you can do with the models, templates, and views. Coming up in the next couple levels for Django, we'll talk about uh, using template tagging in better ways, and then also talking about forms, so actually getting user input. So if, something's, or if someone visits your website, how can they save information through forms? All right, thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next level of Django. Hello everyone, and welcome to Django Level 3. Hopefully you are now excited by the possibilities of the MTV workflows, those models, templates, and views workflows that we've already learned about in Django Level 1 and Django Level 2. But we're still missing a big piece to creating a full website, and that is user input. In this section, we're going to be covering how to use Django Forms to accept user input and connect it to the database and your models, and then retrieve it later on. All right, let's get started. I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to the Django Basic Forms lecture for Django Level 3. 
In this lecture, what we're going to be doing is conceptually walking through the process of creating a form with Django. So we won't actually do any coding. You can just sit back, relax, and watch this lecture almost like a game plan for the next lecture where we're going to be coding through a lot of the topics we discuss here. All right, we've covered forms when discussing HTML. So you might be wondering why bother with Django forms? What extra features do they bring to the table? Well, Django forms have lots of advantages and here are three distinct ones. The first one is that they can quickly generate HTML form widgets. Those are things such as your inputs where you have to specify the input will be an email type or a text type, text area type, etc. checkboxes. Forms with Django allow you to just generate those quickly like with template tagging. Another advantage is that you can validate data and process it into a Python data structure so you can quickly use it in the back end. And you can also make your own custom validation rules. And then a third point is that you can create form versions of our models and then quickly update models from forms. And we'll talk about that in a future lecture. Okay, so let's actually walk through the steps you would have to take in order to create a form on your website from your web application. And the very first thing you need to do is actually create a forms.py file inside your application. Just like we previously created a urls.py file inside the application, we have to create a forms.py file because it doesn't come standard. After that, we call Django's built-in forms classes, and this looks very similar to creating a model of Django. Let's see an example of this. So an example of what would be inside your forms.py file inside of your application would be something like this. You say from Django import forms, and then you have a class form name, forms.form, where every input is essentially a class object attribute. And you should notice that this looks a lot like creating a model with Django. So that's really good because you can have that similar feel across various aspects of Django. So you don't need to relearn a completely different paradigm for creating a form. It feels and looks like a model. Again, looks similar to a model. And now that we have the form created inside the application's forms.py file, we need to show it using a view. So inside your views.py file of your application, we need to import the forms. And there's two ways to do this. One is you can say from dot import forms and dot just means look at the current directory, or you can do what we've been doing in the past and actually explicitly saying from forms import and then that actual form name. So if we go back, we call the class form name. So if you were inside of your views.py file, you would say from that forms.py file you just created import that class object form name. And again, that dot just indicates to import from the same directory as the current.py file. Either one of these methods is okay. Once you've imported the form, you can create a new view for it. And it looks really similar to when you were creating a view and calling a model, except this time you're actually calling a form. So you say your function def, form name view, whatever you want that actual view to be called. It takes in a request to create a temporary object called form equals forms dot and then whatever your class is. So again, that's the forms.py file, the class from it, set that equal to a variable, and then return render, pass in request, pass in the name of the HTML file it's going to hold that form, and then you pass in the context dictionary, where you have a, some key bringing back that form from form name. Again, very similar feel to how we were working with models in our views.py file. And then all you have to do is add the view to the app's URLs, either directly or with the include function. If you do it directly, it just looks something like this. You'll say from your application, import views, and then somewhere inside your URL patterns file, you'll say the URL function, pass in the actual extension of your URL that you want the form to be on, views dot, whatever the view is called. So in this case, we called it form name view, and then you give it a name such as form name. Again, I'm using really generic terms here, so you can later replace them with your own names. All right, so we can then create the templates folder along with the HTML file that will hold the actual template tagging for the form. And remember to update the settings.py file to reflect the new template directory variable. We did that in Django level one, so you can review it or you can watch the next lecture where we'll go and start the process from scratch so you can remember how to actually fix that in your settings.py file. Okay, then you should also remember that your views should reflect subdirectories inside templates. And again, we'll talk about that when we walk through it in the next lecture. And once you've done that, everything is set up for us to go into the form name.html file or whatever HTML file is going to house the actual form itself. And that's going to be usually placed inside your templates folder and then the subdirectory of your application folder and add in the actual template tagging that will create the Django form. 
So just like we injected with template tagging stuff from the model, we can quickly inject the actual form. So there are several ways you can inject the form using template tagging. You can just pass in the key from the context dictionary. So remember the key from the context dictionary we had was just form. So you would just have the set of curly brackets and pass in form. You usually won't see it so plainly, but this is technically all you have to do. And before we continue, let's have a quick side discussion about three topics, HTTP, GET, and POST, since we're going to be using those to connect our form to our actual backend. HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol, and it is designed to enable communication between a client and a server. The client submits a request, and then the server responds. The most commonly used methods for this request response protocol are GET and POST. GET requests data from a resource, and then POST submits data to be processed to a specific resource. Again, pretty simple idea. A request and then a response. So those are the basics that we need to know for now, but you can check out the w3schools.com page on GET slash POST for a lot more details, like what remains in browser history, whether you're using GET or POST, and what can be cached for future use. It's a really simple concept, so you can just check out that page, but basically, you just need to know that you're using a sort of request response protocol when working with forms. And once you've put in that forms template tag, you should be able to see a very basic and honestly ugly looking form on that page. However, you won't actually have an HTML form tag there. So let's look at what a more completed form HTML page would look like. So on your form page.html, realistically, you're gonna have something that looks like this. So we've had some added bootstrap class styling calls, and that's the div class container. And we're also calling the form as underscore p, which uses a paragraph. And that's going to allow you to have a nicer layout of your actual form. It's going to return it within paragraph tags. That way, they're actually lined up from top to bottom instead of from left to right. If you just use form by itself inside those two sets of curly brackets, it's going to go from left to right and you're not gonna have a form looking form. That means top down instead of that left to right. And that gives you a nice format to work with using those paragraph tags, which are automatically put there with the as underscore P. And you can also check the Django docs for other methods. You can request a form as a table, for instance, and work with it that way. And you also notice that I added the CSRF underscore token tag. So this is actually the first time we've encountered thinking about site security measures. That little CSRF tag token, that if we go back, it's right underneath the actual form template tagging. That is a what is known as a cross-site request forgery token. And that secures the HTTP post action that is initiated on the subsequent submission of a form. So when you click submit, you have this cross-site request forgery token that helps protect the user or your website from getting false data or from a user accidentally sending that data somewhere else. So the Django framework actually requires that CSRF token to be present. If it's not there, your form may just not work. So that means Django security is actually built into the fact that it won't really work unless you provide that token. So you'll get into the habit of just remembering to provide that token whenever you're working with forms. And it generally works by using what's known as a hidden input which automatically uses some random code and checks that it matches the user's local site page. We don't, know, we don't need to know uh, a whole lot about how that random code is generated, but basically just know you always need to add in, if we go back two slides, you always need to add in that CSRF token to make sure your form works correctly and that it's secure. Okay, so again, just need to remember to put that template tag there. You don't need to worry about the background. Now that we can show the form, let's discuss how to actually handle the form in a view. Okay, so right now, if you set up everything the way you've been describing and you had a submit button there and your user clicked it, nothing would happen. And that's because we still need to inform the view that if you actually get a post back, meaning the user submits and has a response to your request for information, you should actually check if the data is valid. And if so, you can then grab and use that data. And you can actually do this by editing the view. So far, we just showed you a simple view. We're going to talk about a more advanced one. And later on, we'll actually talk a lot more about form validation, and now you can have your own custom validation rules. But for now, upon receiving a validated form, we'll assume it's just valid, we can access what's known as a dictionary-like attribute of that actual data called clean data. And this will look something like this. 
So in, this is inside your application's views.py file. We've edited the view a little bit. First, we just had that form is equal to forms.form name. And then we had all the way at the bottom that render request, form page.html, and then the form form. And what we've added in is everything in the middle. So the basic steps look like this. First, you check to see if you actually get a post back, meaning if the request.method is equal to post, that means your user hit submit and is posting something back, in which case you want to pass in that request. So what you say now is form is equal to forms.form name, pass in that request.post. And then you want to check if the form is valid. And we'll talk a lot more about form validation in a future lecture. But once you have that, you can call form.cleanData and then access the information with a key dictionary call. So here you can see I'm just printing it out straight into the console. So I'll say form validation success prints in the console, and then I will print out the name, email, and text they provided in that form. So it was a very simple form, just asking for three fields. Okay, so we still have a lot more topics to cover, like customizing form validation, connecting forms to a model, which we haven't even really discussed yet. But before we do all that, let's get some practice with what we know so far and create a basic form project and application from scratch. That's really going to help your understanding. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture where we're going to be coding everything we just talked about. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Form Basics Code Along Lecture. In this lecture, we'll just be coding through all the concepts we previously discussed in the last lecture. Let's go to the editor and get started. Okay, here I am at the editor. The first thing I'm going to do is CD into a new folder I just made called Django Level 3. And then there, I'm going to actually create the project. So I will call my Django-admin command line tool. We'll say start the project. And we can just call this project whatever we want. I'll call it something like basic forms. And this should start off the project. And after that, we can start off the application. So I will CD into the top level basic forms and then call it Django admin start app to start our application, and we can call this just basic app. It's using simple names here, and now if I expand this, I see the folders and files that I was looking for. And let's actually create our templates folder that goes under the top level project folder. Create a new folder, call it templates. And then inside of this, I want to create another folder that matches the basic app name. And this is where the application's HTML templates are going to go. And then we'll create a new file here, call it index.html. And we'll create another file. And this one we can call something like form underscore page.html. So under this index.html, that's just going to be the home page. I'll type HTML and we'll give it the title home. Say heading one, welcome to home page. Save that. And then the form page, that's where we're actually going to be using template tagging and doing a lot more. So we'll just leave it with the title forms for now, but we'll do a lot more at this page later on. What we need to do is actually edit our settings.py file so it knows where the templates are and that we have an application that we just made. So we'll open up settings and then let's set up the template directory. So that's going to be template underscore dir and we'll set that equal to os.path.join and I want to join the base directory with templates. And then what I want to do is scroll down to where we have installed apps, make sure I include the app I just made, which is basic app, and then continue to templates and pass in that template directory I just made. There we go. So I will save this. So now my settings are ready to go. And now we can get started with actually creating the forms which means inside of my basic app, I'm going to right click, create a new file, call it forms.py, hit enter, and then it's going to look very similar to building up a model. We'll say from Django, import forms. Previously we had done import models. Then we'll create a class. I'll call this just a very basic form name class. And then we'll say forms.form, again, we basically did models.model last time, so hopefully this feels really familiar, just using the same paradigm. And then we'll say name, let's create a couple of fields. So now instead of making database fields, we're making essentially what are form fields, those text inputs, text areas, etc. So this will be a character field for the actual name. 
We'll also have this person provide an email in their form. So we'll say forms dot, let's say an email field. And then we can say, let's have a text area field. So the way you do that is you say forms, pass in a character field. And inside of this, you can specify a particular widget. And you can check out the documentation for a list of all the widgets available. But essentially what you do is just call forms and then pass in the widget method or widget attribute that corresponds to the actual type you would specify in the HTML. So remember when we were making forms of HTML, we would specify, oh, this is a type text area input. Here we're just specifying it as a widget inside of this character field. And you can kind of see how this would match up later on when we connect this to a model. Right now we're just using a very basic form. Later on we'll see how to use model forms. Okay, that's really all we need to do here for the forms.py file. What we can do now is set up the views that will actually return these pages correctly. So we'll say from, and I can just say from dot import forms, or I could also say from basic app import forms. Okay, it's basically the same. And let's create an index view. Just get that out of the way. That's going to be a simple request. And we'll return render function with the request and let's pass in the actual file we want to do. So that goes under templates, which is going to be then basic app index.html. And we'll start off with a very basic view before we actually check for the post. So the most basic view you can get for a form looks something like this. So whatever your form name view you want, it takes in a request. And then inside of this, I'm going to say the form is equal to and I imported forms dot and whatever the actual class you call that form. Here it's telling me we we'll call it form name, so that's fine. So we'll make an instance of that form name class here. And I'm going to return with the render function, pass in request like we always do, pass in the page I want to show. In this case, I want to say basic and we call that page form underscore page dot HTML. And then finally the context dictionary. We'll give it the key form and we'll pass in that actual form object. And again, you can be flexible with whatever you want to call these things. Maybe you don't like that I'm using the word form so much or basic so much. It's really up to you, whatever you want to call these. Now that we have these views set up, we want to make sure that we actually point URLs in the right way. So I'll come to the project urls.py file. We could also have urls.py file point to the applications URLs and do it that way. Remember it was including this other URL configuration. We'll just do a simple function view for now. Keep things pretty simple. So let's add in a URL call here. Well, first we actually need to import from our application. We'll say from basic app import views. That way I can call them. We'll use the function method here. Remember that's this very first one where we just use this syntax. So come down and then say URL and I'm going to specify for the home page. That's just caret symbol dollar sign using regular expressions and then say views.index and we'll give it the name index. And then I like always having the first two be the home page and then the admin site and then everything else being your actual pages. So we'll say regular expression caret symbol and let's have the extension for this be something like form page. It's really up to you whatever you want to call it. This basically just says okay if you go to your URL slash form page and anything after that it's going to take you to the views dot and then the view. In this case we called it form underscore name underscore view and we'll give it the name form underscore name. All right, so that should be all we need for the URL patterns. And now let's actually go with the templates and show you how to use the template tagging to actually inject that form. Our index page looks pretty simple. We'll add one more thing that says go to slash form page to fill out the form. Let's double check that that was the actual URL I gave slash form page. Yes, it was. And then on the form page, we're going to, let's put this all in a div that we can use later. I'll give it the container class. I haven't imported Bootstrap yet, but that's okay. We'll show that when we kind of want to improve the site, but let's keep everything super basic. 
and I'm going to just say form here. Again, I'm not even checking if there is a form, I'm just saying form. Let's save that and see if we actually can get everything to work. Hopefully we didn't forget anything. But I'm going to say python manage.py run server. Hit enter. Let's see if there's any errors that pop up to us. Okay, now I'm going to copy this and bring in over my browser. So it looks like we got the home page working out. We see go to slash form page to fill out the form. Let's see if that also works. Go to form page and here we can see the actual form. We have name, email, and text. It looks super ugly um, and we see if I type something in, there's not even a submit button here. So it's pretty uh, bland, but we can see that we're actually starting to get the very basics of a form. Here's that text area widget. Great. Now let's add some stuff to actually improve this and most of it is going to happen on the form page.html and in the actual forms.py file. First thing we want to do is let's just actually make this look good since we're going to be looking at it quite a lot. I will say here in the head of my HTML files, I'll paste in the link to Bootstrap. Just going to use Bootstrap 3 for now, keep things simple. And we'll also do it in the index.html. Save that and let's put all of this inside of a container class. And let's put that inside of a Jumbotron just to make the home page look a little nicer. We'll grab these two headings and then put them inside these divs. Save that. And then for the form page, we have to add in uh, quite a bit. So we have that container class, so that works out for us. But notice we actually don't even have any form tags. And those form tags, so the basic form HTML tags, those are not made for you when you call form here. So what you need to do is actually have those provided that way you can say what you want to do. We'll don't, we won't worry about class or action for now. You can worry about class when you want to style this a little more with Bootstrap. But for now, this div container should be enough. Let's add in a heading here that says fill out the form, save that, and then I'm going to request a form as underscore p. And that's going to request each of those form widgets to be instead of a paragraph tag, that way they don't go from left to right, but instead we get that actual line break and they go from top to bottom. And then we also need inside of these form tags to ask for the input. And also as a quick note, I have the method right now being post inside of the form, lowercase or capital, that either way it should work. So we'll capitalize it just so it's really clear there. And I want the input to be type, let's make it submit and we don't really have to give it a name for now. We could give it a class if we want it to look a little nicer. We can say btn and then btn primary from those bootstrap classes. And let's give it a value so we actually see something inside the button. And we'll hit save. So now I'm going to grab that URL again, see what it looks like. Bringing that in, obviously the home page looks a lot nicer with that jumbotron. And then let's go to form page see what that ends up looking like. And this looks way nicer with the bootstrap, fill out form, we can see stuff is looking good. But notice if I hit submit, um, well, let's actually fix that email, gmail.com, I hit submit, and I'm getting an error, CSRF veri verification failed, request aborted. So remember, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, we need to have that tag there in order to have the security that we need to make sure our users are safe from submitting their form or submitting data to some other website. So, as I mentioned, a lot of these forms are going to break if you don't have that tag, which is a good thing. Keeps you a good, safe programmer. So let's add in that token. We'll save it. And you can add it above or below the form. Should work the same. And I'm going to refresh the page and make sure it's working. And to do this, I'm actually probably going to need to restart the server. So we'll say python manage.py run server. And then let's come back to this again. And now when I re come to the page, and you have to uh, not just refresh, you have to go back to it. Here, let's see if I type some stuff out. If we'll actually try accepting something. So if I hit submit, notice that over here on the bottom, I had a bunch of get calls, but now I get a post here. So it's actually accepting the information. Now let's show you how you can do stuff with that data. So we'll edit our view. Coming back to views.py, 
we have our very basic form view. It doesn't really do anything though when I actually post the data. So we're, as we were mentioning in the previous lecture, if you just have this view and this form, you have a good looking form, you have the token so it's secure, but you're not doing anything with that data once it gets posted to you. So what we're going to do is come back to views and actually show you a very simple example of something you could do it with it. Um, you're not going to just print out the data into the console, but this will show you an idea of how you can actually grab that data. Later on we'll show you much more complicated things you can do with the data. Right now we'll keep things simple and just print out whatever the person puts into that form directly into the console. And what I'll do to start off is have the form equal forms that form name. That's fine. Let me collapse the tree so we get a little more room here. And then the first thing I'm going to do is check if the request then call the method attribute is equal to post, meaning someone actually hit submit and posted something back. I'm going to need to pass in that request. So now I will say form is equal to forms dot form name and then pass in that request dot post. And depending on what plugins you have, if you downloaded some Django plugins, uh, you'll have a lot more help in syntax highlighting here. So keep that in mind. And then we'll say if the form and it has a method called is valid, which is essentially a Boolean check to see if the form is actually valid. And we'll talk a lot more about custom validation checks later on. Right now, this should automatically return it's valid as long as it uh, works with the HTML inputs like the at symbol in an email input. So again, if the form's valid and the request method is post, I can do something here. So this is where your do something code will work. So let's show you a very simple thing you can do with it. And let's just grab the data and print it out. Probably would never actually do this, but just to show that it works. So we'll say validation, success. So we successfully validated the data from the post. And then I'll show you how to access that data. So you grab your form object. And then off of that, one way to do it is by grabbing dot cleaned underscore data and then those actual fields that you had in your form. So if you go to forms.py, remember we had these object uh, class, class object attributes, the name, email, and text. Coming back here, that's what you pass in as the key. So I can pass in name here. And then I can print this out directly into the console. And to show a little bit of nicer formatting, we won't just print that out, but I will say name space. And then we're going to do this again for the other two fields. So I'll do a paste here and I'm going to say email and then I'm going to say here text. And if this is ever going too fast for you, you can always reference the notes and you can reference the presentation, the slides that is, for kind of a walkthrough of the steps we're doing here. And then we have email and then whatever text they happen to put in the text area. Okay, so we'll save that. The render stays the same. And now let's bring our, let's quit the server and run it again. We shouldn't have to do this, but just to make sure that everything uh, got posted as a change and bring in our browser. Okay, so here it is at the home page. And what we're going to do is go to slash form page. We'll fill out the form. So we'll say, my name is Jose. My name, email is hello at gmail.com and then some random text. So if I hit submit now, we see it here printed out in the console. Jose emails hello at gmail.com, text, etc. And that is the very basics of a Django form. Hopefully you can see how powerful Django is just with the most basic form. You can grab data that the user inputted and easily work with it. And you had the advantage of just having to put essentially uh, two very small template tags in the form. A lot easier than what we've seen in the past. Okay. Thanks everyone. If you have any questions, feel free to post the Q&A forums. I would definitely suggest that you try coding this out on your own, just using the notes as a guide and the slides as a guide. Thanks. I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome to the form validation lecture. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing hidden fields and how we can use them for custom field validation. The way our form is currently set up in our previous project 
it's actually pretty open not only to users to maybe misuse the form or give bad information, but also potentially to bots, that is automated scripting programs that come in and fill junk information into your form on your website. Django has actually built-in validators you can conveniently use to validate your forms, uh, not just for user misbehavior, but also for bots. And everything we do here is going to be limited to the forms.py file. So instead of going through the concepts in slides, we're going to jump straight into coding it all out. And we'll use the basic app from the previous lecture. So you can either just download that from the notes, or if you worked along with the previous solution lecture, have it ready to go. Okay, we'll do three main tasks here. We'll add a check for empty fields. We'll add a check for a bot, and then we'll show you how to use a clean method for the entire form. Okay. Let's hop over to the editor and let's get started. Okay, here I have the editor open. I have the forms.py file that was under basic app or your application. And remember we have three basic inputs, the name, the email, and the text. And over here on the right, I have a browser that's connected to my local host. Right now I'm actually not running the server, so let's check it out. I'm going to say python manage.py run server, hit enter, and I can see that the server's here, so let's refresh this page. And then it says, welcome to the home page from last time. And let's type in slash form page. Go to it. Here I see the name, email, and text. So again, remember, if I type in a name, type in some email, type in some text, and I hit submit, I actually get it printed out to the console. Name, email, and text. Now, let's start off by looking at how we can use hidden fields. Now a hidden field is something that remains in the HTML, but is actually hidden from the user. And a lot of times we can actually use these to try to catch malicious bots on our website. And I'm going to collapse the directory here so we get a little more space. And let's create a field called bot catcher. And we'll call forms, it'll be a character field. And we'll pass in the requirement or required parameter to be false. And the reason we want to spe specify that required is equal to false is because when we actually have this field, it's not going to show up on the page for the user. It's only in the HTML in the background. So we actually need to inspect the page to even see that bot catcher exists. And we'll show that in just a moment. And then the next thing we want to do is define what widget we're using. So the widget parameter is going to be from forms. And instead of a text area or a checkbox or something like that, we're going to be using a hidden input. And that's what is going to allow us to hide this from a typical human user. And you can also give a label here. Uh, we won't need to do that. So let's actually just close that off. Those are the only two parameters we need. So if I save this and my page reloads, if I refresh, and let's actually say cancel, I'll hit submit one more time, refresh, hit continue, and I'm going to inspect the page. And in the elements, actually don't need to check out the style so we can collapse that. I expand the body, it says fill out the form. I expand the form and I see not just my CSRF, remember that token, but if I expand this, I also see that I have this bot catcher input. So remember that the CSRF, that's also helping the security of your website. You can see it actually has this uh, basically a random code value that's randomly generated for the user site, and Jingle's going to check that that matches on the back end. And that's just an extra layer of security to make sure that the input you put in the form isn't going to some other website or vice versa. Now, the input that we just made was bot catcher, which is given the ID automatically, ID underscore bot catcher. It's given the name bot catcher, and the type is hidden. And basically what's going to, going to happen here is if a bot visits your page, they will not look at the actual website. What they're going to try to do is look directly into the HTML. And then they're going to try to automatically fill in value attributes and then submit the form that way. Now, if I am actually acting like a bot, I would, let's say, edit an attribute. Actually, we would add an attribute here. And the bot would come in, add a value, and say, um, hello, friend. Maybe they give you that value. You hit submit, and right now the way it's working, 
uh, nothing is really happening here. So if, again, if I add that in, hit submit, you can see my extra characters are being added. So just to prove that one more time, if I type ZZZ, you can see it shows up here. The way we want to actually catch the bot is by validating this particular input. So let's show you how to do that now. So we'll show you first the most basic method of validation, which is using a clean function or a clean method inside of your class form. And then later we'll show you the built-in tools that Django has so you don't have to do this every time. So every time you want to create your own custom validator using this default method, you need to say DEF, so a method inside this class, then you use the keyword clean, underscore, and then whatever name of the field you're checking. In this case, it's bot catcher, so you can just copy and paste that. So then Django's going to automatically look for methods inside this class that start with clean underscore, and then see if this matches any of the fields there. And remember, this is a field inside of a class, so we use self. And then this is what I'm going, whoops, that should be a colon. Okay, self. And this is what I'm going to do first. I will say bot catcher is equal to self dot, and then I'm going to call the cleaned data and actually grab what bot catcher returned over here from my forms. And then I'm going to check if the length of bot catcher is greater than zero. You could also just say if length of bot catcher, but this might be a little easier to read, which means so if there's any actual length to the value that's returned in bot catcher, then I know some robot came in and scraped the page and filled in the HTML. A human would never actually do that. And then we're going to say raise an error. And there's lots of different errors you can raise. And you won't really have to worry about memorizing any of this because we'll move on to built-in validators. But just to give you an idea, the most basic one you're going to raise is a validation error, which kind of makes sense. And then we have something we can return, which would be printed to the console. And we'll say, gotcha bot. So once we raise that error, we'll return bot catcher itself. So we save that. It's reloaded here since we made a change. And now let's try coming to this again. So go to the home page and then go to the form page. I'm going to fill out the form. So the name, we'll say Mr. Robot. The email, we can say it's Elliot at EvilCore. And then we'll say hello as a text. And then if you're a bot, what you're going to do is you'll come to this bot catcher. Since remember, you're actually filling it all in through the HTML. And let's add an attribute here for the value. And we'll label it sneaky since it's a sneaky bot trying to ruin your website. We hit submit. And then if we see what happens over here, nothing actually got returned. So we never actually printed anything because we end up raising that validation error. So again, if I hit submit here, I'm not actually ending up returning anything. So again, nothing's being printed out into the console because we're raising that validation error. And if you actually look at the page, the error has been outputted here on the page. It says hidden field bot catcher gotcha bot. So instead of actually printing out this user information, name, email, and text, we ended up actually grabbing that bot. Great. So that's the very basics of how you can use a clean underscore method inside of your form to do your own validation. But now let's show you how you would more realistically use validation once you're building your own websites using Django's built-in validators. Okay, let's continue by moving on to Django's core built-in validators, which will save you a lot of work in the future. So pretty much you'll never really do this clean underscore type of bot catcher validation. Instead, what you're going to end up do, doing is using the Django core. So we'll say from Django.core import, and then you're going to import validators. So save that. And then what you're going to be doing is in your actual fields here, you will pass in a validators parameter. So we'll say validators is equal to, and this is where you actually can pass in a list of validators. So what you end up doing is calling validators dot, and then you can check the documentation, but there are a ton of already built in validators, things like checking what's the maximum length of the input, uh, how many characters it has, etc. And what we can do is say, use one of the built-in ones. So one of the built-in ones is max length validator. So that's a built-in method off of this validators. And what we can do is then just pass in as a parameter, 
a number here, and typically you'd want whatever the max length is, a lot of times it's gonna be zero to check, especially for a bot, right? So basically, we replaced all of the work we just did with a simple import call, import validators, and then in all of these fields, you can always pass in a validators parameter, and this can take in a list of validators. So it's not just limited to one, it can pass in more than one. So we can save that, and then what we're going to end up doing is running this again. So we'll come here, and then I'm going to refresh the page, so delete that, go back to the home page, and then come back to form page, fill out the form, doesn't really matter what we do, go x, x at gmail.com, x over here, or a, doesn't matter, and then let's go in and do the bot again, so I will add an attribute, value is equal to fooled, let's make sure that matches, hit enter, and then let's hit submit and know what happens. Hidden field bot catcher. And then we actually see Django's built-in validator message come back. Ensure this value has at most zero characters. It has six. Great. So you can see that Django already has even more information built in as a report back. Okay. So hopefully you see that this is way easier to use than that clean method we had. All right, now that we've discussed Django's built-in validators, let's talk about how you can make your own custom validators using the same sort of methodology of passing in a validators parameter. Imagine we wanted to check for the name field that it start, started with a Z. We wanted to really make sure that for whatever reason, the names had to start with a Z. Well, maybe you didn't bother to check the documentation or couldn't find anything for your specific validation of starting with a Z or if a character starts with a certain letter. So what you end up doing is if you wanna create your own to pass in as a validators parameter, you just create a function outside of the class and then you can name the function. So we'll call this check for Z. And the thing here to make sure is that it takes in value. And this is kind of the keyword that's gonna help Django realize that this is going to act as a validator. And we'll say if value, whatever is returned here for this field, in this case, we're going to check for Z. So we'll say if value at zero is not equal to the character Z, and we can do further is do like lower here, we'll raise an error. So we'll raise forms dot validation error and say something like needs to start with Z. And we'll say name just to make it clear. Save that, and then inside this name, what I can end up doing is saying validators is equal to, and pass in a list, and then just pass in my check for Z function, which since it takes in value, Django knows it's a validator now. So I will save this, and let's make sure that my run server actually got refreshed, so I will refresh that. Okay, perfect. So now over here, what I'm going to do is say form page, and then let's fill out the form. First, we'll fill it out with just Jose, hi at gmail.com, and then some junk, hit submit, and it says name needs to start with Z. Perfect, so we know our own custom validation is working. Let's make sure it is by passing in just Z here, and then we'll say the same thing, and it took it in just fine, and it printed it out just fine. All right, so that is how you can make your own custom validation function. And this is usually a lot easier of an approach to take, than that clean method we discussed earlier. Okay, now let's continue our discussion by talking about cleaning the entire form all at once. So we did see how we could create custom clean methods in our class for particular fields. But maybe sometimes you just want to do one method that cleans the entire field and you don't want to worry about having to do something like an individual validator. So what do you do in that case? Well, let's delete this check for Z and I'm going to remove this validator over here. We'll save that, and we can still check for bot catcher, that's fine. Actually, you know, we don't actually need that. Let's say we wanted to check something like a backup email. So a lot of times when you go to a website, you have to fill out your name, and then fill out your email, and then you have to verify your email. You have to fill it in twice, which makes sense because you don't want to have happen as you log into a page for the very first time or you're signing up that you mistype your email. Otherwise, there's no way you'll ever get a message to that email. So we can call what's a very common field as verify email. And this is something you'll see often. 
I'm sure if you've used the internet once, you've seen this. And we'll have verify field, and we're just going to give this a label to say something like, well, that should be equal, sorry. And we'll say, um, enter your email again. So let's save that, and let's refresh the page to make sure that actually worked. Hit continue. Okay, perfect. So this field is required. Enter your email again. And you can use formatting in the HTML to make this all look nice. Since I'm asking for a paragraph, everything's kind of getting their own line break. But again, this would all be done with HTML or CSS styling. Right now, what we really care about is how do we clean this entire form at once to actually grab this email, grab this second email, and make sure they actually match. Well, just like we had the special clean method where you would say clean underscore and the name of the field you wanted to check, if you want to clean the entire form, all you have to do is just say clean. And that will indicate to Django that this is just a single clean method for the entire form at once. And what you can do here is call super. And what this is going to allow us to do is grab all the clean data at once. So we'll type a new variable. We'll call it all clean data. And then we call super, close parentheses. And then off of that, you call the clean method. And this is going to return all your clean data for the entire form. So you can deal with it all at once. And then off of this, you can grab certain fields. So we'll say email is equal to that all clean data. And then say, using bracket notation, because it's basically a dictionary, grab the email field, where this key comes from up here. And then we also want to grab verify email. So we'll say, we'll call it vmail for a verify email. Again, it's the all clean data, and I want to grab the verify email key. And then what I'm going to do is say if my email is not equal to my verify email, I will raise an error. So I'll raise a validation error, forms dot validation error, validation error, and say whatever. So make sure emails match. Probably don't want to yell at the user in all uppercase, but it's fine for our purposes. And in this case, we don't actually need to return anything. Um, if the clean runs and everything works, that's totally fine. We don't need to return. Okay, so let's actually run this on our page. I'm going to run my server again because I cleared it here. Say python manage.py run server, hit enter, make sure it's running here. Perfect. I'm going to refresh this page. And then what I'm going to do is call the form page. So here I see my name, email, enter your email again as the label, text. So we'll say my name is Jose. And we're actually going to do a non-matching email first. So we'll say a dot, well, we'll say a at gmail.com and then b at gmail.com. So two different emails. Enter some text here. If I hit submit, I get back, make sure emails match. So it's cleaning the entire data form and you can do whatever you want with whatever fields from the data form. So now let's make sure these match. If I say Jose AA and then hit submit, looks like it's good and it actually prints out my name, my email and text, which means there was no errors. All right, that's the very basics and some more advanced features of how to actually custom validate your forms. So again, you can call your own custom clean underscore method to check just a simple field. You can use the built-in validators in Django, which is what I would recommend you do. And if you ever want to clean the entire form at once and do all your operations there, then you can use def clean and that will clean out the entire form. And remember, whenever you're creating your own custom validators, you want to make sure you pass in the keyword value before you pass it in here to one of these fields. All right. If you have any questions, definitely post it to the Q&A forums. And I would definitely suggest if you plan on using this in the future to check out the documentation page for Django's validators. It has a lot of useful information there as well as a ton more examples in case you want to see more. Thanks, everybody, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Model Forms lecture for Django Level 3. We've seen how we can use Django Forms to grab information from the user and then do something with it on the back end. And so far, we've only printed out that information directly into the console. Nothing too useful. But what if we actually wanted to grab that information and save it to a model? So maybe we have a user that's signing up for our website and we want to save their information to a model. 
or someone's inputting a reply post to a comment. We want to save that information to a model so we can always have it on our website. How do we actually do that? Luckily, Django makes accepting form input and then passing it to a model very simple. Instead of inheriting from that forms.forms class, we're instead going to be using forms.modelForm in our forms.py file. This helper class allows us to create a form from a pre-existing model. We then add an inline class, something we haven't actually seen before, called meta. And this meta class provides information connecting the model to the form. And that topic of an inline class is actually really simple. It's just a class within another class. Let's see some example code of what this new type of model form class would look like. All right, so this is the most generic code example that you would find inside an application's forms.py file. The very first thing you need to do is the actual imports. Just like before, we'll say from Django import forms, except this time we're going to be using forms.modelForm instead of just forms.form. And then we also need to actually import our model from the models.py file inside our application. So you can import this however you want, Typically, you'll see it done from my app .models, import my model. A lot of times people also say from dot import models dot my model, etc. Then we have the actual form class. So you have class, whatever you want to call your form. In this case, we're calling it my new form. And then you inherit or derive from the forms dot model form class. So this is a subclass of that model form, very similar to what we did before. Right below that, you have the form fields that we showed earlier in the course. And then we have the meta class, that's the inline class. And this is what's really going to connect the model to the form fields. So again, the fields attribute inside of that class, that inline meta class is going to do a lot of the connection to the model. So right now I have it in red about certain options, but let's discuss a little bit more about that inline class. So there are many ways to make that connection on the fields attribute of that inline class meta. But you first need to think about security for the fields. And it's also very common to not actually provide any additional field information. So before I mentioned that form fields like we typically saw would go right below that my new form class. But often, since you're already matching up the form to match up with the model exactly, you don't actually need to specify those fields. So you'll typically just see the inline class immediately after that form class. So that's very common to see as well. And you can have the form be just generated completely from the model. And that saves you a lot of work. You don't have to type in those fields again. All you have to do is say class meta model equals my model and then connect the field somehow, which we're going to talk about several options in just a little bit. But if you want to actually use custom validators like we previously discussed, then you do have to pass in those form fields where you provide the validator parameters. So most of the custom, most of the custom validation you'll have to provide if you want it, but the automatic cleaning and validation will be directly from your model. So remember your model had its own constraints and those sort of validation just come automatically when you call class meta and connect that to your model. So it's really up to you how you want to see this. It's very common just to see this class, your form, and then directly below it class meta and not have to worry about any custom validation. All right, let's continue on by discussing how we can actually work with that fields attribute that's inside that inline class meta. So option one is just to set it to the special keyword underscore underscore all underscore underscore. And basically what that does is you're grabbing all the fields from the model and you're going to place them into the form. Option two is to specify what fields you actually want to exclude. So here you can just pass in a list of the field names that you want to exclude. So you'll say my model and I actually don't want to include field one in the form or field two in the form. And then option three is to actually list the included field instead. So you can debate whether you have a huge model if it's easier to just include or if you have a small model if it's easier just to exclude. It really depends on what is better for you. All right, so we briefly went over the options of how to connect the field, but I definitely suggest you check out the documentation for more discussion on how to connect the fields in the form to the fields in the model. The documentation page is really great for the model forms. Basically just Google Django plus model forms. It'll take you there. It has a ton of examples, ton of different situations, and more discussion on certain security things. So if you plan on making this a big website where for some reason malicious users are going to come, uh, fields and forms are definitely something you want to keep secure. 
Django has a lot of built-in stuff. We've already seen things like the CSRF token um, and even these special calls to options take security in mind. But if that's a big concern for you, definitely check out the documentation's full discussion on that. Okay, so let's get some practice for all of this. And what we're going to do is try adding a model form to our Pro 2, that was that second project from Django Level 2. So this project, if you remember, had a single user class in its models.py file. What we're going to be doing is connecting it to a form allowing users to register their names and emails to the site. And this sort of logic could easily be used to create a simple coming soon landing page. So you've probably seen these single one page websites where you go in, they're working on a project and they say, oh, you know, come back soon or we'll email you to let you know whenever the project launches and it just has uh, enter your name, enter your email address and submit. And then when you submit, that information goes to a database that they can later access. So this is easily something you could do just based off of the information in this lecture plus everything we've already learned about. All right, so to get started, make sure you have the Pro 2 folder from the Django Level 2 folder in the notes. And to see the completed version of this, check out the Pro 2 folder in the Django Level 3 folder. Again, we're going to start with the finished Pro 2 folder from Django Level 2 and then work with it. By the end of this lecture, we'll have what's available to you in the notes under Django Level 3 Pro 2. So keep that in mind if you want to see kind of a before and after. And let's get started. I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome to the Model Forms Exercise Lecture. In this lecture, we will work with the Pro 2 project folder from Django Level 2. So if you still don't have that around, you can just download the notes and grab that Pro 2 project folder. Remember from Django Level 2, that final project was to have that user with that HTML file use template tagging to display a list of all the users and their first name, their last name, and the email information. So we had that for loop inside that template tagging, and then we displayed all that information directly from the model. We're going to change this to be a signup page, and it's going to be connected to a model form that we previously discussed, so that the user goes to slash users, signs up on the user page, and once they hit submit, that information goes to the model and the user gets taken back to the home page. A great exercise would be to try this on your own first. So optionally, you can attempt these exercise steps before viewing the rest of this lecture as an attempt to try this on your own. And these are the steps you're going to have to follow. You'll need to create a model form in forms.py. You'll have to connect the form in the template. Then you'll need to edit views.py to show the form and work with the form in case there's a post. And then you'll figure out how to save the data. That's something we didn't talk about in the previous lecture. So as an exercise, you'll have to look up in the documentation how to save the data. And the way I wrote save here is a really big hint on how to do it off the form. Once you figure that out, then just verify that the model is admin registered. So once you hit submit, you can log in as an administrator and see that the data is actually there inside the model. Okay, so again, I highly encourage you to try it out on your own, and you're going to need to look at the documentation in order to do that successfully. If that's not really your speed and you don't feel that comfortable doing it yet, feel free to just continue watching this and code along with me. All right, let's get started. All right, here I am at the editor, and right now I have my Pro 2 project inside a folder called Django Level 3, and it has the app 2, that was the second application we made. If we take a look at the templates, we have this index.html page, and then we have the users. And remember, this was the template tagging we used earlier to actually display all the user information directly from the models. And we're going to be replacing all of this with an actual form that connects directly to the models. So uh, as a quick note, depending on when you actually downloaded this, you may not have the models registered on your admin.py file. So make sure under app2 admin.py for this pro2 that you have these two lines here, app2.model import user and admin.site register user. Remember, we need to register our models in order to see them when we log in as an administrator. All right, let's start off with the front end actually. And then we'll come back to it later on as well. But here on the index page, we'll say welcome, go to users2, and we'll say sign up. And I'm actually going to add in uh, Bootstrap so this looks a little nicer. And I already have copied and pasted the link from bootstrap.com or getbootstrap.com. You can do the same. So I'll put that on the index page, and I'll also put it on the users page. And in the next section of the course, we'll actually learn how we can uh, use one single basic template and then keep inheriting from the same template. So you don't have to keep writing so much HTML. But for right now, we'll have the same link in both of these files. And on this users page, 
this H1 is going to say, please sign up here. And I'm going to clear the rest of this since we won't be using it for now, everything else that's in the body. And just to make this look a little nicer, we'll put it inside of a container class and then we'll grab this and put that in here. And then on the index page, that home page, we'll put all of this into a container class as well. And in fact, let's put it all into a Jumbotron just so it looks a little more home pagey. Then grab this stuff and we'll put it in here. All right, looking good. And we'll come back to users.html and do some additional stuff in here with the actual form later on. But let's come to the forms, excuse me, app2 folder where we need to make a forms.py file. So we'll say new file, forms.py, hit enter, and we should have the forms.py file empty here. Now what we need to do is import forms as we did last time. So we'll say from Django, import forms, and then we also need to import our actual models. So we can say from dot, but I prefer actually naming it. So we'll say from app2, even though we're in the app2 directory, they don't need to actually say that. I could just say from dot. We'll say from app2.models, import, and then the actual name of the models we intend to use. In this case, it's just user. And now it's time to create that class. And in this case, we will call this something like new user. And we'll say forms dot, and then we call model form instead of just normal form. So typically, before we were just using form, but if I actually want this to connect to a model and edit that data, I'll have to use dot model form. And then we also have that inline class, which is going to be this meta class. And if you want to do your own custom validations, then you would define a field here, something like uh, whatever they're actually called, first name equals blah, 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 the forms dot character field. And then eventually you would add in your validator. But right now we're not going to do any of that. Um, we already covered how to do custom validation. So if you want to do that, that's fine. If you don't, that's also fine. And we'll say class meta and we'll create the model attribute. This should always be called model. And then you assign it to whatever model this form happens to link to. In this case, it's just one form here, user. If we had another model to import, that would have its own class with its own form model or own model form, I should say. And then we have the fields attribute. And we talked about the fields attribute in the previous lecture and the various ways to handle it. Since we're going to be using all the fields, we'll just use that special keyword, underscore, underscore, all, underscore, underscore, as a string. And as a quick note for this meta, you could either just do meta like this or have the open close parentheses for Python 3. Uh, that doesn't matter. It's basically the same thing. And now that we have that ready to go, let's go to our views.py file and make sure that it's connected to the form properly and that it's going to do something if the user actually hits submit. So we'll come to views.py. And right now we just have our previous users that was returning information from the model. But instead we're going to be returning information directly from that form. So we'll delete that. Right now the index view, that's totally fine. We'll keep the same home page returning index.html. But for users, we're going to do something a little different. The first thing you have to do is actually make sure our form is working, which means we need to import it. So previously we were importing the model direct, uh, directly we won't be using that since we're not actually grabbing information from the model to post. We're just going to grab stuff from the form. So we'll say from, and in this case, app2 dot, and it's the forms, import, and we're going to import the new user. And just to make it really clear, let's actually call it new user form. That way we don't get confused. So we'll come back to forms.py and let's call this new user form, save that. And then in views, we'll call this new user form. That's a little clearer to me, just so I don't get anything messed up. And then we're also not using HTTP response anymore. That was one of the most basic things we learned about. So we'll comment that out. So we basically just have the render and the user form. Then we're going to be working with this. And let me grab some space here by collapsing the directory tree and also collapsing the terminal. We'll bring them back in a little bit. But the first thing I want to do is create a object or a variable here called form and assign it to an instance of that new user form. So create an instance of that new user form inside the users view here. And then we'll say this, if the input request method is equal to post, then we're going to reassign form to be equal to 
an instance of new user form, except we'll pass in request.form, or excuse me, request.post. And then we'll scroll down, let's get a little more, let's focus on this one view function here. So okay, so basically what we're saying is, right now our form is an instance of that form class we just made. If the request method is equal to post, meaning someone hits submit on that form and is sending information back, we pass in the request.post. And then we check if it's valid or not. And as we discussed before, you can have your own custom validation checks, but we'll just do the automatic ones. So if the form is valid, meaning essentially they didn't mess anything up when hitting the submit button, so an email was an email, etc. Then here's the thing we didn't cover. In order to save the form, you can say form.save as the method. And what you can also do in order to commit it to the database is say commit is equal to true. So we'll save that. So we have if form is valid, form.save commits true. And then after this, what we're going to end up doing is returning. And we'll return the index page. So we'll return the index view and then pass in the request. So what this basically means if someone says post, meaning they give back information and it's valid, we will save that form using the save method off of it. And then I'm going to return the index view of the request, which in it, will just return the render request of the home page. So this will basically take you back to the home page. Now, what if they actually don't do anything? So we can say, have an else statement here. Let's say the form isn't valid. Um, we can just say else. And there's a lot of things you could do, like raise an error, etc. Right now we'll just print error form invalid. We won't actually end up experiencing this because we're not gonna uh, have an invalid form anywhere. And then outside of all this, we need to actually return something so that it matches the actual page. So we'll say DEF users, and on the very first level of indentation inside of this view function, I'm going to return, and we'll say render, request, and then pass in wherever our users page is. It's under app2, and let's make sure that the folders matches. So under templates, we see app2, so that's actually capitalized, although as a string passing it, I don't believe it makes a difference, but we can always just check on that. So app2, remember templates, app2, index.html, this goes to templates, app2, and we send back uh, whatever our page is, and it was called users.html. Then finally, we want to send back that context dictionary that actually contains the form, and it's very common just to give it the key form, and then pass in that form object, which is this guy. All right, so we will save that. Now let's go back to users.html and fix this up so it contains the form. So the first thing we need to do is actually create that form tag. We don't need to really worry about action right now because we're kind of handling that ourselves, not with the HTML. And we don't need to assign it a class. If you want to add more styling to it, you can do that. We definitely need to say method is post though, and either lowercase or uppercase works. I like putting it in uppercase just so it's very clear to me what's happening. And then what we're going to do is use that template tagging and we'll pass in form. Technically, that's all you need to do, but in order to get those nice line breaks, we can say as underscore P. So that way each actual thing, each actual widget of the form is a paragraph tag. And then remember, this is something beginners often forget, is that CSRF tag or token, I should say. So we have CSRF underscore token. And we need that in order to make sure the form is secure and just so it runs, period. And then finally, we need the input. So the input style is going to be, or the type will be submit. We don't need to give it a name. What we can do is give it a class, just since we have bootstrap here, let's make it look a little nicer. So we'll give it a class btn and then btn primary. And then finally, the value, whatever the button's actually going to show, can be submit. All right. So hopefully we've taken care of everything. We have our users HTML ready to go. Index looks good as well, Jumbotron. Uh, the URLs are already matched up from the previous iteration of this project. So we have users calling app2.urls and urls.py here is looking good, users.users. And then we have our actual views. This was probably the hardest part out of all this. And it's returning back that dictionary, which we're calling in the users.html over here with form. So let's actually test this out and see if it all worked. I'm going to CD into Pro2. And then what I'm going to do is say Python manage.py and then we'll say run server. 
if depending on how far you got in the previous Django level two pro two folder, you may need to actually run the migrations. Um, if you went along with me throughout the entire co course and were coding along correctly, then you shouldn't need to make those migrations. But keep that in mind, you may need to make the migrations in order to have everything be connected. But I should already have everything connected. So let's actually run the server. Let's make sure we don't get an error out. So that's a good sign, no error. Let's copy this. Actually, we don't need to copy it because I already have it here on my URL. So I'll just refresh. OK, so far, so good. It says, welcome. Go to users to sign up. So let's do that. We'll go to slash users, hit Enter. And now we get this please sign up here. Also looking pretty good. Let's make a really obvious first name. So we'll say, I'm new first for the first name. That way, when I look into this page as an administrator, I can easily know that I actually worked correctly. Uh, last name, we can say my last name. And then email will say uh, it worked at whatever, yahoo.com. We'll hit submit. And perfect, it took us back to the home page, just like we uh, thought it would. And we can see that it also sent a post. So that's looking pretty uh, good right now. Now let's go to the admin site and make sure it all worked. So we'll go slash admin. And if you don't remember your username or password from Django level two, feel free to just use python manage.py create super user. Remember that command, all you have to do is provide your username, an email, and type in your password twice. So hopefully I remember my password. It was just test password, something very simple. And my username was Jose. We'll log in, see if that works. Okay, looks like I did not remember my password. So I don't remember this, so let's actually create a new one. Uh, you probably are in the same boat as me. So we'll say python manage.py, create super user, and then let's give it Jose email address, hello at gmail.com, doesn't really matter. And then the password, this does matter. We'll say test password, test password. And now let's try this again. So we'll say python manage.py run server. I'm going to refresh my actual admin page. And now let's try this again. So Jose, and then test password, log in, perfect. And now if I expand this, I can see here, I have app to users. And as I mentioned a few times, uh, users may not be the best name because under authentication and authorization, you already have users, but it's up to you. Keep that in mind. Right now, everything's so simple and small, shouldn't be much of a difference. So we'll click on users over here and we see we have a bunch of user objects. So if you ran the population script, you'll also have a bunch of user objects. The most recent one should be the one at the top, which is the one we just entered. So let's click on it. And here it is. I'm new first, my last name. It worked at yahoo.com. Perfect. So now we can do whatever we want with this as a super user, but basically we just showed that the user can input information and then we can access it in our models, which connects to a database. And that's the basic premise of using a model form. All right. I hope you now really see uh, the power and hopefully your mind, the gears are working here and you can essentially realize that you now have the power to start making almost any website you want to make. You have the ability to gather information from the user, save it, and you also know how to return it back to the user. I'll be, you know, in very simple fashions, but eventually the rest is just styling. Okay. Hope you enjoyed the lecture and I will see you at the next section of the course. Thanks everybody.